Well, good afternoon. Welcome to this very special broadcast of the Race the Comrades Marathon Legends. My name is David O'Sullivan. Alongside me, I have Mosabudi Whitehead. And as you can see behind us, we are virtually outside the Moses Mabida Stadium, where it's completely empty, unlike the scenes that we would have been experiencing had there been no coronavirus, had there not been a cancellation of the Comrades Marathon. But we know that around the country and around the world, people are virtually running the Comrades Marathon. We've been seeing some of the footage coming in. We've seen some of the times being posted. People running all sorts of different uh, distances, whether 5, 10 kilometers, even 90 kilometers. For myself, well, I've uh, covered Comrades Mar uh, Marathons three times, but uh, my co-host, Mosbudi Whitehead, has not only covered the Comrades Marathon, he's run, is it six you've run altogether, Mosbudi? Running and walking six, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your best time? My best time is 10.54, but I'm probably most proud of my 11.57, when I understood the pain of chasing that final gun. Whew! Pain from start to finish, and I understood the comrade spirit. You were also out uh, looking at some of the runners uh, earlier, but we'll come to that a little bit later. I do also want to bring in two of our other guests who are going to be with us throughout this broadcast. And a man I really feel needs no introduction. You know his pedigree so well. Nine wins. Uh, it is the great Bruce Fordyce. Bruce, good to see you. Good afternoon. So have you been for a run, Bruce? Okay, a little bit of a technical problem. Can't actually hear Bruce at the moment, but let's bring in another man who, a former athlete's manager, and I can uh, call him an encyclopedia of the Comrades Marathon, Kieran Walker, also joining us. Good afternoon, Kieran. Hi, David. Hi, Mossy Bodhi. Uh, thanks for having me on the show today. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, would have preferred to be at the real Comrades, but uh, this is the next best thing. So it's awesome to, to be here today. I'm liking what I look, I can see over your left shoulder. What are those? Are those medals? Uh, yeah, it's some medals and the Comrades route marker from the, from the actual race. I, I took it after the event was finished. <laughs> now we're going to try and get Bruce's audio. Let's see if we can hear you now. How are you doing there, Bruce? Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Dave. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you so much. Have you been for a run this morning yet, Bruce? I have, David. I did the virtual 10K this morning in the company of my wife. Uh, considerably slower than I used to run, but uh, considering a much more fun. Had there not been a cancellation of the Comrades Marathon, was there any likelihood of you actually doing the race? Uh, no, David. You know, I've, I ran my, I think, probably my last Comrades in 2012. And that was my 30th. And I can't think of a finer way to finish a comrade's career than to run the last kilometer and the last lap of comrades with Zola Bud. And uh, that will for me be as memorable as winning. And uh, it was an extraordinary thing to finish with Zola. She was running her first, I was running my last. And I thought that was a good way to end a comrade's running career anyway. Uh, it sounds like the perfect way to have done it. Uh, let's bring in at the at this time the chairperson of the Comrades Marathon Association. We've got Cheryl Wynn joining us. Hello there, Cheryl. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, Martha Betty, and to my good two good friends, Bruce and Kewen. Lovely to be with you this afternoon. Thank you for having us. It's an absolute pleasure. It is rather unusual to be in these circumstances. Do you have a tinge of sadness or possibly more than just a tinge of sadness at the circumstances, Cheryl? Well, yeah, no, obviously it was an incredibly sad decision and, and, and we certainly anticipated that today was going to be an incredibly sad day. And then sort of five and a half weeks ago, we came up with the idea of, of putting on this virtual race and it has so by far exceeded our wildest dreams that it's, it's, it's really hard. Anybody that was out 
on the roads anywhere in South Africa today and saw it and experienced the tremendous spirit that was out there. It's, it's just impossible to be sad, yes. No, of course, we would have loved to have staged the real race, uh, you know, the 2020 95th Comrades Marathon today. But, um, you know, the way the runners came together and the way the race has been supported, uh, you know, it's, it's just been phenomenal. We had 43,500 entries. We only had 27,500 entries for the real race. So you can see that there's just so much love and support out there. And, you know, it really was a great day. It really was awesome. Out on, I was out on the route. I happened to live at the top of Fields Hill. So I got to run right along the route and there were runners all the way, everyone sort of observing the social distancing. There weren't, I didn't see any groups lo larger than three or four runners. Everybody had their masks and, and, and everyone was so incredibly friendly, greeting one another. You know, you often run along that road and, you know, people will barely greet one another because they either have earphones in or whatever and they're listening to music but today the spirit out there was just one of togetherness and it was exactly what the comrades marathon is all about and you know it really brought home just how much this race means to the people of south africa and certainly to the runners it seems to me cheryl that you've got an additional problem for next year's race because you're right there were lots of runners out on the road even up here in Gauteng, especially during the 21 kilometer i think you'll have a lot of runners saying to you next year we want this virtual race because even, uh, shall we call it the real race, even if that goes ahead in 2021, there'll still be people who'll say, we want that comrade spirit in some of the shorter distances. Food for thought? Yeah, uh, I think, race? you know, today might have been a bit of a game changer. I mean, we, we really, it, it, it was so beyond our expectations, the support that we got. And obviously, we're going to have a lot of debriefing sessions afterwards, but there's clearly a demand out there. There is obviously and always will be only one real comrades, 90 kilometer comrade, you know, comrades marathon. But there's obviously a huge demand out there for something else. And we'll need to see how we can meet that demand because, you know, we, we've been talking for years. How can we expand this race? How can we, um, you know, bring in younger people? Because, you know, the thing about comrades marathon and I mean, Bruce just explained, I mean, he ran his 30th, you know, it's almost impossible to do just one. Once you've had some sort of association with this event, you, you know, want to go on and on. And so we need to find a way to bring in younger people and we'll be talking about it. And I have a funny feeling that this, you know, although it was intended as a once off, I don't think that, that that's how it's going to turn out. <laughs> So you were, you were out on the road a little earlier, and I think, uh, I, I would like to think most people do know that back in uh, 1982, um, a young woman by the name of Cheryl Jorgensen won the Comrades Marathon. Um, I hope people know that you are, in fact, a, a Comrades champion. How fresh are those memories of the win in 82, Cheryl? You know, it's, it's, it's actually something that, you know, stays with you for the rest of your life. No one can ever take it away from you. I was, a, you know, what was it, a, a, a one-win wonder. It was fantastic. I came twice second to the great Isabel Rush Kelly, and I came fourth on two occasions behind Lindsay Waite. So in between, I had my own win. No one can ever take that away from me. It was a wonderful experience. And, you know, it, it, I remember Lindsay Waite used to often say that, you know, Comrades Marathon changes the entire course of your life. And it certainly did for me because, I mean, ever since then I've been involved in athletics and and very much like bruce and, and 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 q and it's you know you just fall so in love with the sport with the runners that you just want to keep on giving back and i've heard bruce talk about his um park runs and talk about how that's his legacy and i mean that's it's 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 it's, a, it's just something that happens you just want to keep giving back to this sport that gives you so much well the one thing about the comrades marathon is that it throws up so many legends and if I could just for a moment pay tribute to some of the legends that we lost um, over the past year. And I think one of the most prominent was the man who wore number one, Clive Crawley and Kewen and Bruce come in at any stage here as we pay tribute to Clive Crawley. He was a remarkable man um, running with the number one. What happens to that number now? Do, does it get retired? Cheryl? Are you asking me? Or yep, Cheryl, what do we, what do, we do with the number one? It's it's your number in perpetuity. You, you finished ten comrades marathons, and you earned and well, Bruce did his the hard way <laughs> with three wins. But um, you know, once you've earned that number in perpetuity, it's retired and it's yours forever. 
Um, a few people have taken the decision to pass on their green numbers to um, very close family members. My husband, for instance, has given his green, passed his green number on to our son. But in general, it's, it, it, it belongs to you and you're the only one that can give it away. Yeah, I don't think anybody else is going to run number one. Uh, Bruce, Cly uh, uh, Kewen, have you got memories of Clive Crawley? Uh, yeah, I, I have a lovely memory of him in 1979 uh, uh, when I had finished third in the Comrades and I came back to Peter Maritzburg for some reason, I can't remember what it was, uh, and I bumped into him in the streets in Peter Maritzburg and he took me by the shoulder and he said, listen, young Vitsi, he said, your third place was really, really good. Your second half was very fast. You realize you can win this race. And so for me as a youngster, I think it was my third comrades, even back in 79, I think Clive had probably done well, 20, I don't know, comrades marathons. To hear that from him for me was very special from comrades number one. Kieran, any memories of Clive Crawley? Yeah, you know, growing up watching the race, uh, I was always in awe of uh, Clive Crawley having run so many comrades marathons, I couldn't even believe it myself. And, you know, just to show you how talented he was, I remember back in 1998, which um, coincidentally Cheryl that year um, met me at the, the Comrades Expo through Barry Varty, who was a previous chairman himself, and asked me if I wanted to go on the press track the next day um, as an 11-year-old kid. And that was like a dream come true for me. Um, so I was on the press track that day. And then I remember being at the, on the finish gantry, um, you know, after the winners and stuff had come through. And that was the day when Clive actually finished his uh, 40th Comrades. And he still ran under nine hours that day. And I was like, wow, this, this guy is so amazing to, to, to be finishing your 40th Comrades still under nine hours, which is a really respectable time, just shows um, you know, the legend that he was and forever will be. Another person who passed away uh, is Eliz Elizabeth Kavanagh, who goes down in history as the first uh, official uh, winner of the women's race in 75 after Letty Van Sale got disqualified. Kieran, can you, do you know the circumstances why Letty Van Sale was disqualified in 75? All I can see is that she didn't meet a, a qualifying standard. I wouldn't know. Was there a qualifying race? Was she too young? What were the reasons? Do you know? Uh, not off the top of my head. Um, 75, as, as you mentioned, was the first year that um, women were allowed to run the, the Comrades Marathon, but um, I can't recall the circumstances as, as to why she was disqualified. Maybe Bruce uh, might know um, more, a bit about that. Um, yeah, in fact, to be quite honest with you, Kieran, I'm not sure that we had to qualify back in those days. And when I say that, I, my first one was two years later in 1977. <laughs> I don't remember having this qualification uh, demon hanging over my shoulder. I, at the risk of exaggeration, would say I, I can vaguely remember that you could almost enter comrades up until the last moment um, for, uh, I think in those days, a massive entry fee of about five rand. Um, <laughs> I don't remember qualifying. There must have been some other reason. That yeah, I can come in here and help you out a little. Um, uh, Cheryl, come on, I help us. I can help you out a little bit with what happened in 1975. Of course, it was the first year in which um, the Comrades Marathon was open to men and women of all races. But it also happened to coincide with the only year in which um, a yes. limit was put on the number of entries by the local traffic authorities. And so it was restricted to 1,500 entries. It's probably the only time in history that the race was actually restricted to a number. And so it was done by a computer draw. And Elizabeth Kavanaugh happened to be lucky in the computer draw. And so she was an official entrant, whereas poor old Letty Van Sale, who finished at least an hour ahead of, of Elizabeth Kavanaugh, not to take anything away from Betty because she was, you know, a great winner and, 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 and I mean, at the end of the day, she's the one in the record books. But that's what happened is that um, Letty Van Sale unfortunately ran the race unofficially because she missed the computer draw. Oh, a computer draw. Okay, well, she still went on and got herself three titles in uh, the following three years. The other people who we lost, one of the great characters of the Comrades Marathon, Tommy Malone. You must have endless stories, Cheryl, about Tommy Malone. 
<laughs> you know, Tommy, Tommy, we were lost, Tommy and Jackie <laughs> Mendo. I mean, it's really sad to lose two of our, you know, great champions, you know, both in the last, in, in the past year. I mean, they were both very close friends of mine. I used to um, be involved with Transvaal Athletics and Tommy Malone was the chairperson of the, of the, the Transvaal, what was then called the Transvaal Convener, um Selectors. And I was also on the committee. We used to have all the meetings in Tommy's office. And he was a great character. He really was. Jackie Meckler was such a gentleman. In fact, both of them, they were absolute gentlemen of the sport. Where, you know, that, that famous run of, of Tommy's where he's, he's, he's more ta- famous for coming second yes, than he yeah. is for coming first. And that, maybe that was the his one regret in life is everybody forgets that that he actually won the year before he had that trip right before the finish and was beaten by his own very good friend, Monty Good. That's right, 66 is when he won it and then uh, was pipped at the post in 67, a very famous bit of footage there as well. I'm, I'm sure Jackie Meckler and Tommy Malone are, are people you knew well, Bruce. Um, yes, both of them. So, I mean, it, it's just, I can't believe that the con- Rhodes doesn't have those two great characters anymore. I mean, just Tommy alone, to listen to him talk, and particularly the the repartee and the teasing and the banter that used to go between Tommy and Marnie Kuhn, because the two of them beat each other uh, in two consecutive Comrades marathons, and the two characters were so different. So Tommy was this extrovert, loud Scotsman. And it's an amazing thing about uh, Scottish people. They can have left Scotland for 300 years. They never lose their accents. (laughs) And then there was Marnie, who was dour, reserved, quiet, humble Africana. And the two of them were almost like twins. I, I miss them so dreadfully because Tommy used to always tease Marnie and then Marnie would try and reply. So... To just to give you an example, there would be a gathering where there'd be a whole lot of winners together, and Tommy would say, "Oh, we would lose it." Bruce, the winners at the... across the finish line. Sorry, Bruce, you're gonna, we, we lost you for a. You see, he passed Tommy in the last stride. Sorry, Bruce, you can oh. start that story one more time because we lost you at the critical moment. The last last part of that story. I will, but. <laughs> Uh, was that they, they they always tease each other and so yes. um, Ma, uh, Tommy asked Marnie to uh, ask us to tell Marnie what it was like to carry the winner's baton across the finish line. You heard that bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so Marnie, because Marnie passed Tommy on the last stride, he's uh, one of the only a couple of winners who have never carried the winner's baton across the finish line, and I can promise you that to carry the winner's baton across the finish line is one of the most magical moments in sport anywhere. Um, It doesn't matter how tired you are, how much you're cramping, how much pressure you've been under, that winner's baton is like a magic wand in your hand. It's like like a lightsaber. And there isn't a single winner I can think of who hasn't raised it to the sky. As you get it, you just, you pump the sky with it. And of course, Tommy would say to all of us, tell Marnie, because Marnie was, a, they, when Tommy collapsed across the finish line, they tore the baton out of his hand and they handed it to Marnie. <laughs> and so Marnie's response always would be because he, 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 wasn't, he, he wasn't as nimble as, as Tommy was with, with the teasing. His response would always be, shut up, Malone. Um, <laughs> and there was a time when we, we drove, we, a whole lot of us winners were driven a, to a function actually to launch I'm a Beady Beady at a, at a, a, a venue uh, somewhere around, uh, I think it was around the top of uh, Inchanga. And we were all traveling together in a combi. And as we went through Drummond, which is halfway, Tommy had been sitting at the back of the combi. He suddenly got up and he ran to the front of the combi. And we said, what are you doing? He said, no, no, I just want things to always be normal. And that is that I, as usual, I went through halfway ahead of Marnie Kuhn. <laughs> and Marnie was still sitting at the back. And then Cheryl, sorry if I'm dominating the conversation here, but the memories are so, for me, so fantastic. Cheryl was part of a group of people who organized a winner's reunion in 1983. And every winner around 
the world attended. Uh, and it was a glorious, glorious, wonderful weekend. And no one could have a bigger ego than anybody else because everybody there had won, but everybody there had been beaten by somebody else who was in the room. And because of the rivalry, and it was a black tie function at around about midnight. So you can imagine we had had a couple of glasses of wine. Uh, at midnight, we staged a final uh, rematch between the two, because of course you have to remember Tommy beat Marnie by 20 minutes in 1966, and Marnie beat Tommy by one second in 1967. So we had the rematch, the decider, and we decided to have that around the parking area of that hotel. <laughs> and I was the start, and Alan Rob was the, uh, was the judge at the finish line, and we mapped out a little 200 meter route, and it was a fantastic race. Uh, but unfortunately, Marnie didn't see the speed hump. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the end of the race. But uh, so I miss them both because it was just every year. And then again, uh, please forgive me if I'm dominating, but I think Jackie Meckler has to be the most humble, was the most humble, most incredible winner of the race. I mean, he five times winner. A lot of people don't know that he would have been an eight times winner but he lost three times to uh, English runners. He lost to Dave Bagshaw. I think he lost to Bernard Gomesol and to John Smith. Um, and he was a simply superb runner. And he ran in the very, very famous Commonwealth Games race in Vancouver, where they ran in scalding temperatures and all the officials abandoned them and went to the stadium in order to see the race, mile race of the century, which was Roger Bannister against John Landy, the only two men who'd ever beaten four minutes for the mile. And so they were left out there in the sweltering heat with no seconding and no water and everything. And uh, in that particular race, um, Jim Peters uh, collapsed in the, uh, in the finish straight. He had the gold medal in sight. He collapsed in the finish straight and crawled across the, or what he thought was the line, but it was a couple of hundred meters to go. It is a horrific thing to watch. You cannot let children watch it to see a man zigzagging across the track and trying to keep going. And in that incredible race, uh, Jackie finished second. So he was also a silver medalist in the Commonwealth Games. Uh, that's an, a, a fabulous story. That 1967 race is quite remarkable. And I think it is worth uh, having a look at that final finish as Marnie Kuhn overtakes um, uh, Tommy Malone right on the line. Have a look at who's carrying the baton. Early morning in Peter Maritzburg sees hundreds of runners at the start of the 56 mile Comrades Marathon. Lights of a long convoy of spectator carrying vehicles sparkle in the pearl grey light of pre dawn. It mightn't be hot enough for that hat yet, but just wait till old man's sun starts beating down. A young girl tries her luck. In this testing race, you need plenty of willpower to back up your stamina. 46-year-old Fanny Maria jogs along at a nice, even pace. But it's up the Maritzburg Hills that the going really gets tough, and a man appreciates some refreshment. Number 62 is last year's winner, Tommy Malone. He's led for nearly half the race, and at this stage looks like making it two in a row. Malone hits the home stretch at Durban and heads for the tape. With mere yards to go, he falls. Staggering up, lunges desperately forward, but Marnie Kuhn takes first place. Among the first to sympathize with the gallant Malone is fine sportsman Marnie Kuhn. Congratulations to two great athletes for their fine effort. Uh, it's absolutely amazing every time I watch it. Cheryl, we'll uh, let you go. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on this special broadcast. And we hope uh, next time we're talking about Comrades Marathon in 2021, it'll be at on race day itself. Thank you so much. And all the best. Thank Thanks. you so much. Bye. The chairperson of the Comrades Marathon Association, former champion Cheryl Wynn. We, uh, in the next few minutes, we're going to get uh, from Athletic South Africa, Alex Skosana. But I realize, uh, Kieran, I haven't asked you for memories of Tommy Malone and Jackie Meckler. Share some thoughts there. 
Yeah, uh, I'm still quite uh, quite young to have spent any time with uh, both gentlemen, uh, to have met them personally. But you know, as Bruce mentioned in all the stories, um, two remarkable individuals, very humble, and um, I will never forget that sprint finish uh, that we saw just now on our screens. And um, I don't think there's ever been a closer sprint finish than that in, in the history of comrades. Um, Bar besides maybe the Nogalieva sisters crossing the line together, but that wasn't much of a sprint finish. And then obviously mm-hmm. last year, um, Edward Mutibi just edging out uh, Bongusa and Tembu uh, by just over 30 seconds to take the win. But yeah, two remarkable gentlemen and uh, forever in the history of comrades. Now we've got um, an issue uh, that Bruce raised that it is only the two occasions where the winner hasn't carried the mayor's message. So it's obviously that occasion where uh, Tommy Malone had the message and Monty Kuhn won. Is the the other occasion when Shol Matthias was disqualified, Bruce? Yes, so Shol was unfortunately disqualified for a uh, a, a doping problem. Uh, it's very controversial and there are many opinions about it. Uh, happily, Shaul did come back and win the 1997 comments. That was 1992, I think. And so uh, Jetman Sutu was declared the winner uh, a few weeks later of, the, okay. of that particular race. There's a little bit of uh, Comrades Marathon trivia for you. Yeah, some history and definitely Jackie Meckler will be missed. He was still around at his races up here in, in Gauteng, a race named after him um, in uh, the Pretoria area. And you'd often see him standing by that 25 kilometer as people get ready for comrades, encouraging runners. Such was the humility of the former champion. We now uh, hear from the president of Athletic South Africa, Bab Alex Kosana, to talk to us a little bit about how and why this race is so important. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you so much for talking to us. It took a long time for the announcement to be made that comrades would eventually be cancelled. We first heard that it would be postponed when the uh, national state of disaster was announced in early March. Such is the importance of the race on the South African calendar that the idea was to uh, play it safe and wait and see. Why is Comrade so important to Athletic South Africa, to South Africa and running in general? And good afternoon to all the viewers all over the country, the continent and the world, wherever we are reaching the people. So I think you will understand that um, when COVID-19 was announced as a pandemic, as a global pandemic, everything changed from normal to abnormal, from certain to uncertainty. So it was very difficult from the side of Athletic South Africa to say, yes, this event will go ahead and this event will be postponed. And we had to play it by the ear and wait for the rules and regulations as they were being developed by the government of the Republic of South Africa, up to a point where we finally decided with comrades that the race is not going to take place. And I'm happy that we did that because today we still we are still under a alert level number three where we cannot be able to host events of this magnitude. But uh, we are also grateful that uh, the virtual um, platform emanated and we see many people, more than the actual number of the participants who were going to run the Comrades, the 27,500. I think we exceeded almost 40,000 uh, uh, virtual runners all over the world. And uh, we are grateful about that. And it means that we will never be the same again as comrades or sport or athletics. We have to accommodate all these people who have shown interest uh, in participating in this event and other events of this magnitude. That, that would be my next question uh, then, uh, then, President, is that um, what then will be the plans? We've just heard from um, the chairperson of the Comrades Marathon Association, uh, Cheryl Wynn, saying that they also were overwhelmed <laughs> by the numbers of uh, virtual runners, especially in the shorter distances. 
I'm sure you'll be looking to this for next year's race and future races um, and involving younger runners. There was some talk, I remember, about uh, younger athletes' development races in the weeks leading up to the Comrades Marathon. Um, will, will this be at the forefront of your mind going into the 2021 and, and further races to involve more younger participants, especially surrounding areas? Well, remember that we used to have the youth run. It's only this year that we are not having the youth run. And the idea was to accommodate the younger aspirant runners and introduce them to understand the ultra distance running or marathon, as you, as you call it. They came from all the corners of the province of KwaZulu-Natal, and they have grown from small number to thousands of them, supported by the provincial government of KwaZulu-Natal, mainly the Department of Sports and Recreation. We are grateful to the MEC, current MEC, and the former MECs who embraced the idea. And uh, going forward, it's, it's, it's a fact that uh, comrades will never be the same again. We should not do what we have been doing over the past uh, 95 years or so. So we have to incorporate a number of things so that this race can truly be the ultimate human race for those who are doing five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 21 kilometers, 45 kilometers, and 90 kilometers. We have to go back to the drawing board and do things that will incorporate new ideas, create new traditions and cultures, and keep the old whilst we are moving. This is a, an eye-opener. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the villages, if you look at the towns and cities around the globe that embrace this race, it means we have to change our outlook. We have to plan differently, and we need to be accommodative. We need to have those who run the race, the 91 kilometers, and those who virtually run wherever they are because they could not be in the city of Deben or Peter Marisbeck, but they need to be accommodated and treated with respect like all other runners. Um, thank you so much for talking to us. We look forward to next year's race and we look forward to the continued support for the, for the Comrades Marathon. And uh, we look forward to more races sometime, maybe even small ones before the end of 2020. Uh, I know the runners out there are hungry for even uh, 10Ks or 5Ks. So we will wait to hear from your office. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you very much. We'll do that so long as it is safe. We put human life first before any other thing. Thank you very much. Well, well uh, thanks to Alex, Alex Kasana there. And one thing we are def uh, sure about, uh, having heard from Cheryl Wynn as well, is that 2021 is going to be very different. We, in a few seconds, we're going to talk to Colin Hector from Championship because they have been involved in creating this virtual race. But uh, Kewen, uh, some thoughts from you about what Alex Kasana has been saying. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Alec mentioned some uh, very good points. Um, I myself, um, this morning, we, we took our, our son Ethan down to, to the Durban beachfront and he did his first uh, comrades uh, five kilometer. And, you know, it was really amazing just seeing the, the numbers of people that were down at the beachfront with their Bonitas uh, comrades race numbers on. And, you know, little kids, um, people being pushed in prams. Uh, Ethan did about 4Ks in the pram and another 1K on, on foot took forever, but he, he did it and he's getting a medal. And I think, you know, it just it adds another element to um, the amazing race that Comrades Marathon is. And I think that by including these virtual races, um, you know, it's just not uh, mom or dad that are getting to run Comrades, but, um, you know, the rest of the family that don't consider themselves um, maybe as runners and just bringing that whole family together on a weekend, I think it's an, an amazing thing. And, you know, I think with this COVID-19 situation that the world is going through, um, everything is changing. We're learning a lot. And uh, perhaps, you know, what was normal is, is not really supposed to be normal. So, so going forward, everything we do now is going to be the new normal, if that makes well, sense. It does. Bruce, you've been so involved with the park runs, which have been a, a phenomenon all of their own. Do you think uh, a race, the legends, a virtual race as well do you think for the comrades that is something that should be encouraged going forward uh yes absolutely i'm sure it, it's going to be something that uh the cma will think about and and discuss 
as Kuhn said, and as Alex said, I think it's going to uh, make its way into the comrades, yeah, into the whole comrades basket, so to speak. But just, you know, picking up what we were saying about globally, I mean, this morning when I woke up, I was getting messages from friends in New Zealand who were busy finishing their runs. And then I picked up a message from a great friend, Sandy Kondo in Japan, who is uh, running her uh, own comrades. Uh, I see now great friends of mine in Namibia, Kirsty Brits and all her friends uh, have been running for 10 hours and 50 minutes. And they say they are going to break 12 hours for comrades. Uh, it is just phenomenal today what has happened. Uh, running out there today uh, around my suburb, every second person on the road had a comrades Bonnie test number on. There's mine, by the way. I haven't taken it off yet. I've kept mine on track. I mean, you'll notice, it is, you'll notice it's, it's, it's not the common or garden, ordinary white one. It's a green number for somebody who's done more than 10. And that's why I haven't taken it off. And it, today was completely mind-boggling. And cars driving past us and hooting. Yes. And to the two youngsters I bumped into on the road, uh, I was running at the correct distance with my wife, and these two youngsters said, is, is this the Comrades Marathon? What's happening? And I looked at them and I said, yes. And the two of us have done 65 kilometers. And their eyes were like this. They were completely in awe of us. I lied. We had done eight kilometers. But I just wanted them to to think that all over the country people were running uh, comrades and, and how special it was. To my son uh, and my nephew, my son Jonathan, my nephew Mikey ran around Richmond Park in London today. Uh, my son uh, Nicholas ran around series in thick snow today. It has been an incredibly special day. It's not quite over because the true heroes, the ones doing the 90s are struggling in but it has been a really, really special day. And so with, at the risk of, you know, sounding cliched, out of every dark cloud does come a silver lining. And today has been a silver lining out of a dark cloud, which has been that there hasn't been a 2020 comrades and we should all be in that magnificent stadium, Moses Mabida, uh, getting ready for the drama of the final cutoff gun. But, but this has been a magnificent compensation. Well, uh, we're going to show video that Mosabudi took a little bit earlier today as he was coming through um, to the studio. I also saw the guys with their Bonitas numbers as I was driving through to our studio. But uh, in fact, let's have a look at that uh, video. So Mosabudi, uh, set the scene for us. You went out with your, well, you filmed it on your phone. Yeah, so I got up this morning and before I came in, I decided to take a, a drive around the eastern, southern and western um, um, corners of Johannesburg. Um, and I just saw runners everywhere. And that was from about seven o'clock in the morning. I had prearranged with some runners who said, I'm going for my 45 and sub three or whatever. And I just went and got amazing, amazing encouragement from their families. They were being seconded by their families and they were having so much fun. And some were just being helped by community members in Soweto. And that was the spirit of comrades around the country. It was wonderful to see. My first congrats. I'm happy. <laughs> 90Ks this morning. We're yep. doing 90Ks, but we're doing running, running and cycling. We're running 20 and get on the bikes and go and do the rest of the, the, rest of the 90 on the bike. You guys are clearly missing comrades, aren't you? Yep. Definitely. <laughs> we'll see you next the year. Greatest yep. race, <laughs> the greatest race. The greatest race. We're doing a comrades this all run. I'm doing 45 kilometers. It was a tough one, I can say. Uh, we ran, um, so far I think we ran about 40 kilometers. My wife is supporting me. Now I'm going back to the house. I have to just put together another four kilometers in my house. My house. Sure. And I'm done. And I'll enjoy my weekend, eh? Job. How many kilos, Jens? 28. 28. 28. <laughs> lovely, lovely, oh, lovely, oh, lovely. Oh, Are we doing the virtual run? I've enjoyed how many kilos today in honor of comrades. How many kilometers are we doing? Oh, it's lovely, man. Enjoy. Uh, how many kilometers are you doing? Thank you, I really appreciate that. How many thank kilometers? You. I'm doing 90, but I'm on 30. You're on 30? Yeah. You're doing 90? Yeah. Okay, keep going. How many kilos, my brother? 37. 37? Yeah. Randall, that's you? Yeah, it's me. 
The crypto started, yeah. And we have another seven days to go. Are ah, you making it? You're almost there. You're almost there. I'm almost there. You say this year you would have been doing a double green. Double green today. Yes, man. So now you have to wait for 2021. Yeah, I have to wait for 2021. Ah, man. Hey, man, I was looking. I was so looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. I was interrupting that uh, bloke right at the end there. I saw he had a green number. Yeah, he was going to run his 20th comrades today. He would have run his, uh, earned his double green number. So he was a bittersweet moment for him, saying he'll be back next year in 2021 to earn that 20th <coughs> comrades medal. So Bruce, where in Johannesburg can you replicate Polly Shorts? <laughs> can you find a Polly Shorts, did you say, Dave? Yeah, where do you replicate Polly Shorts? Because it's all very well to say I'm running um... the mighty. But if you're not running Polly Shorts, is it, does it really count? Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't count because the problem with poly shorts, and remember, we, the, the runners would not have run poly shorts this year. They would okay. have run down poly shorts in the early morning cool uh, with a bit of frost at the bottom. But uh, the real poly shorts is 1.8 kilometers uh, long. And unfortunately, you get to it after you've run 80. So it's very difficult to explain to people who don't run what you feel like after 80. But um, you are completely broken. Uh, and if you're very fortunate, you've only lost three toenails and now you've got to go up this monster. I suppose, you know, I've, I've run up Jan Smuts Avenue quite a lot. That's probably a kilometer. But um, wow, in Johannesburg, it's tough to find something as, as hard and as steep as Polly Shorts. Uh, the advantage we have up here in Johannesburg, of course, is we have high altitude, which means that we have a 13% higher red blood cell count than our, than our coastal, uh, uh, you know, uh, friends. Um, so we have a bit of an advantage there. But Polly Shorts, that's waiting for everybody in 2022. Exactly. Well, I'm going to bring in now from Championship Colin uh, Hector, because uh, he's been instrumental in getting this virtual race up and uh, up and, and running, I think is the appropriate expression there. Uh, Colin joining us, I, I hope. Let's get him in. There he is. Hey, Colin, good to see you. Good afternoon. Tell us about this concept of the race, the legends. How did it come about? What's the thinking behind it all? Well, I think it was all initiated by the state that the whole world finds itself in with this COVID-19 pandemic and the way it's really shut down everything, not just our um, sports of road running, but every sport around the world has come to an end. And um, as a business that operates in that industry, we actually found ourselves in a position where we had to put our thinking caps on and come up with ideas or solutions that um, could look at things differently. So with the, our partners from Denmark, uh, uh, Morton Toft, who I've worked with for many years, um, he came up with an idea of uh, race the legends across a standard marathon and, and taking some of the great marathon legends over the years and see how we could create an event of that nature. Because although uh, a virtual races have been around for some time and in different formats, we actually felt that you know you need to give somebody a real reason to engage and something to engage with, and in uh, thinking through those ideas, it was very clear that you know there's no greater story in road running than the Comrades Marathon, and it really fits the whole scenario of the situation the world finds itself in. It's in a, a, a crisis situation, and anybody that's ever run Comrades knows that when you're going through tough times, it's people standing together and helping you through that that gets you to the end. And all we've been seeing on the news for many months is all the negatives and the, the problems going on. And we felt that not just comrade runners, but the world out there needs to engage the comrade spirit. So the race wasn't so much about trying to, or the concept wasn't about trying to replicate the, the race on Comrades Day, because that's something that is so special, I don't think we can ever uh, replace that. 
but it was to take that spirit that happens on Comrades Day and expose the rest of the world to it to create a very positive environment. Tell us about uh, the, the how, how difficult or easy, I'm not sure which way it would work, to set up the program, get the technology in place. What was that like? Well, to a certain degree, that is our core business. We've been timing events like Comrades Marathon. I think this would have been our 26th year that we've timed the Comrades. Um, and over the years, technology has developed um, uh, in leaps and bounds. A lot of things are possible. You know, just like we are having these discussions um, remotely at the moment, wouldn't it have been possible you know, 20 years ago? So a lot of the technology today makes it a lot easier, but needless to say, there's a lot of challenges. Um, the take up and response to this has been tremendous. So with close on 40,000 or just over 43,000, I think the number is, um, you know, managing all those results and process on, on the day are quite challenging, but we've got a team of very clever people sitting in the background and ensuring that it works so everybody can enjoy the experience. You've touched on the numbers, Colin, 43,000, that's a lot of people. But what's the breakdown? Because we're used to a flood of entries for 87 kilometers. And of course, with shorter distances being available for the virtual run, uh, we've seen a lot more people entering the virtual run to race the legends. What, what's the breakdown from 5, 10, 21? What have you seen? Yeah, more than half the people, the large majority, are under um, are on the shorter distance, 21K, 10K, and 5K. The 21 and 10K are the, the, the larger numbers. I don't have the figures in front of me um, at the moment. Um, but the, the shorter distance has been attractive to people that are not typical runners. You know, a good example is um, my wife is not a person who goes out running ever. But um, just in the spirit of comrades, she decided to enter and she entered the 5Ks. And, um, you know, she did, did, did that and is very proud of it. So um, that distance was really introduced to accommodate the non-runner that would like to engage in, in the experience as well. Tell there us are about, some of the... Sorry. Sorry, uh, uh, Colin, just the, the, the leaderboards. They, they're quite novel. Just t t tell us about that. We're going to... Show our viewers an example of the leaderboard. Just take us through it. Uh, great. Uh, the leaderboard is uh, typically what we would have at most events like a traditional Comrades Marathon. The one major difference here is that um, number one on the leaderboard now won't necessarily be number one on the leaderboard later on because this event is taking a, a place all around the world and different people are loading up their, their times as they actually finish. So needless to say, somebody faster will come along at a, a, a later stage. But we've taken it one step further than what we would normally have on a, a, a leaderboard in that people can find their results there. And by clicking on it and going down further, we now start experiencing the uh, the race, the legends concept, where um, people can, for example, go back to 1921 and see the time that they ran today, how that would have ranked them and put them in in the race if they were running back in 1921. Now, fair enough, it's not a perfect science because there's a lot of different factors that come into the situation, um, weather conditions. We all know the roads were very different in those days. Um, shoes were very different. But it's a, a novel way of it, people to engage and experience the event. Um, for the typical non-comrade runner, there's also the possibility that we can actually, from a 10K time, do an estimation of what they could expect on that pace to be able to go and run their comrades in. Obviously, we're not saying that will be their comrades' time. The better they train, as Bruce will tell you, the better your time will be at, at the end of the day. Yeah, well, to see how well I've been doing against Bruce Ford. I remember Bruce once telling me, put the treadmill on. I forget how many kilometers an hour you told me, Bruce. And I, I lasted all of 10 <laughs> seconds where you were lasting hours after hours. I, it really humbled me about how yeah. fast I needed to run. Colin, just one last thing about the charities. I presume that the charities of the comrades can benefit from the day in some way? Very much so. You know, the whole concept is not about making money. Obviously, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people devastated by the impact of the um, COVID pandemic. And, you know, many people are unemployed. Many charities that relied on income have actually 
that income has just dried up because companies that maybe supported them, they have to scale back. They have to look at how they uh, spend their money because they just don't have the, the revenues. And Comrades traditionally has a, I'm a BD BD charity um, portfolio, which is made up of uh, six charities, which change from time to time. Um, but they typically uh, uh, generate substantial donations from the public to actually support um, those charities. So that same model has been applied to uh, the virtual race. The one difference is that traditionally runners and comrades would choose to, to pick a charity. Yeah, we've actually created a charity profile for every one of those 43 plus thousand people. And anybody can go to the start list and there's a little icon on there that you click on it for the charity and you can make a donation against that runner. So for example, Bruce Ram today, somebody can go and search for Bruce's name, click on that icon, make a donation, um, or Kewan's son, I think he, he also entered, didn't he, Kewan? Um, you can yeah. actually go and select his, his name, make a donation in his name that goes to any one of those, uh, those charities. So we do appeal to the broader public out there who maybe didn't participate to actually still support um, the initiative because those charities are all selected for the tremendous work that they do but uh, it is very tough times for everybody and um, uh, people sometimes forget about how some of those charities, the resources they relied on the past have literally just evaporated overnight. Fantastic. Uh, Colin, uh, just one last thing. When does the virtual race end? Because obviously the Americans are still, they've still <laughs> got daytime, haven't they? Exactly. So it is uh, intended as a global event. Yes, the majority of participants are from South Africa, but uh, approximately 5,000 of them from are, are from around the world. The New Zealanders are finished already, but the approach is that anywhere on the 14th of June in your time zone, you've got to actually participate in this uh, event. So I think Hawaii, if I've got my geography correct, will be the last um, area where people can actually um, still officially do a comrade. But it does highlight a key point is that this isn't a traditional race. Um, and I, I actually personally don't even like to call it a race. It's really a, a public engagement um, experience. And nobody is going to be disqualified if maybe, you know, you know he ran an hour into uh, the 15th of June. And um, those are not really <coughs> issues that actually impact people. It will take some people because it's a new concept. People are figuring out exactly how this works. Some people might battle to figure out how to upload their times. They can get help and support from the internet or from the, the race office. But um, there's no hard and fast rules to, to block people out of it. We actually want people to, to, to be engaged and to enjoy the experience at the end of the day. Well, well done, Colin, and to you guys at Championship. It's been a fabulous success. And thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Colin Hector there. And now let's remind you of what happened at Comrades Marathon in 2019. And we'll bring Kieran Walker, Bruce Fordyce, Mosabudi Whitehead to talk a little bit more about the winners in the men's and the women's races from 2019. Carpet. You can look at it, it's thick, it's going into thick grass, it feels very hard to just lift your feet walking on it, but Edward Mutivi seems to have no problem negotiating it as he wins Comrades 2019. And he's done it with the unofficial time of 5.31 as well, what a race run for Edward Mutivi. Just nip under that, it doesn't really matter because that was all done on a down run anyway as Khadda Stein becomes the first woman ever to run a Comrades Up run in under six hours. She's going to have the fourth fastest of all time. She is the champion, but more than that, she has broken not only Elena Nurgalieva's Up run record, she has broken so many records. Two Oceans and Comrades in the same year. We last saw that in 2015, but she has taken the record and become the first woman ever to run under six hours. So I think it was hard to stay who took that one. That was with all the headlines, weren't they, Mosabudi? You were you reported on that one. Yeah, an absolutely smashing run. I was um, at sixty at the sixty kilometer mark and as she just jogged past, she had the most wonderful smile on her face. She enjoyed the race so thoroughly and uh, never looked in any any trouble whatsoever. She was always going to win the race. And I remember speaking to her the year before 
after she had ran so well at Two Oceans um, and put it to her that um, you are starting to look like Frith van der Merwe in the late 80s when she went back to back with Two Oceans and, and, and Comrades in the same year. And she just laughed it off but said Comrades remains her main focus every year as well as she's done at Two Oceans and she hopes that she can eventually win it. What a smashing win it was. What a smashing win it yeah, was. Yeah, at 5.58. Kieran, your thoughts on uh, 2019? Gerda and Edward, Edward Mativi's um, performances? Yeah, it, it was an amazing race. Um, you know, history was made with Gerda running that sub six hour. Um, I remember going back to, to Easter weekend last year in Cape Town um, after Gerda had won two oceans and we were sitting at dinner um, with her coach, uh, Nick Bester himself, a former Comrades Marathon winner, doing amazing things um, with his athletes. And we worked out that the pace that she had run at two oceans if she had just run a little bit slower, but um, obviously taking it through to comrades, that should run under six hours. And they kind of laughed it off, but I was like, I'm pretty sure we're going to see a sub six hour comrades. And then I remember commentating um, on the SFBC broadcast last year, and with about 10 Ks to go, um, not to forget the climbing up Holly Shorts, I think Clada had to run something like 42 minutes or so for that last 10 Ks to break six hours. Um, and I called it at that time saying, I, I really think we're going to see a sub six hour performance uh, on, the, on the day. And yeah, it, it was amazing. And then going back to, to the men's race, you know, Edward Motibi running his second comrades ever, uh, finishing fourth the year before on the down run. Um, it was some nerve wrecking moments. Uh, Bongusa and Tenbu obviously was leading the race uh, going up poly shorts. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as Bruce knows, there's a myth that the, the first man that always makes it to the top of Poly Shorts never loses uh, the Comrades Marathon. And Edward passed Bongusa going up uh, Poly Shorts, got to the, the top of the crest in first place. But it wasn't all over until the finish. Um, it was some nail-biting moments there as Bongusa slowly closed the gap, but uh, just ran out of real estate, uh, finishing uh, around 30 seconds behind Edward. But a uh, phenomenal um, win by both Edward and Gada. And, you know, as... Bruce was mentioning earlier about uh, Tommy and, and Marnie being such humble uh, people and champions. The same can be said uh, with Edward Mutibi and Gerda Stein. Um, amazing, humble people, um, you know, it's just, just brilliant performances all, all around. Bruce, let's hear your thoughts, uh, uh, particularly on that Polly Shorts tussle um, that uh, we saw in the men's race last year. Uh, well. David, I, I was actually standing on Little Polly's. That's Ash Burton, or as it used to be called, Impushini, which is 11 Ks to go. And that, to me, is the critical part of the Up Comrades. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible part of the Comrades Marathon. You run up this hill, it has a, a little bit of a break in it, and then you have to climb again, and it gives you a, a grim warning about what Polly Shorts is going to be like. And so for both the leaders, the men's and the ladies, it was fascinating for me to look at it. And I saw Bong Musa and Edward running shoulder to shoulder on Little Polly's. And I thought, well, but, well here we go. We've got a race here. Uh, and as Kewan said, it's a tiny piece of comrades trivia. It will change one day. But so far, the man and the woman who have, and notice how I cunningly use mountain, uh, mountaineering terminology here just to emphasize the steepness for Polly Shorts, the man and the woman who have summited Polly Shorts first have never been caught. Uh, but as Kewan said, Bong Musa was leading going up Polly Shorts. Edward passed him, but only, you know, by a short distance. And so the Comrades trivia was tested again. Uh, in the end, it has stood firm because Edward won, but uh, what a close finish. And then what can you say about Gerda? You can run out of superlatives. She came past me on Little Polly's. She saw me standing at the side of the road. She gave me a cheeky little impish smile and a wave. And I thought, my goodness, this is history in the making beyond all belief. And it was a great privilege to uh, be at the finish standing in the VIP. So there's a VIP section, you see, uh, Dave. And um, uh, they, the VIP section is full of the important people, the officials and the, and <laughs> the sponsors, and of course the politicians. And then the, the, the ex-winners. And so we ex-winners stand there together and have a wonderful time. We get spoiled rotten. It is a complete ego trip for us. But I happen to be standing next to Derek Price, who was one of my heroes. And Derek won two upruns in a row in 1974-75. There were two upruns in a row because 75 was the 50th 
uh, running of the Comrades Marathon. And Derek won that in 558, that particular race. And I remember him saying to me, Bruce, 558, and have a look, Gerda Stein is coming in in 558. And he said to me, honestly and humbly, he said, if you had told me in 1975 that a woman would be running on my shoulder, I would have told you, you are completely insane and you're taking drugs or something. And he said, and here's the disturbing thing. He said, when I finished in 1975, I was finished. I was completely out. I was exhausted. And he said, have a look at Gerda. She is waltzing down the finish straight. Mm -hmm. She's blowing kisses at her family and her fans, and she looks good for another five kilometers. So he says, I have no doubt in my mind that had Gerda and I been together with one kilometer to go in 1975, said, I have no doubt who would have won the sprint finish. Um, and I think to put it into perspective, when I started running to break six hours on an uprun as a man, you would probably win the race, but you would definitely make the first three. And now Gerda has written, written, rewritten the whole timing of thinking about the race, everything to do with it. And so I think Gerda and Frith, I have to be now the two greatest female runners, even though, um, you know, even though Elena Nogalieva has won eight comrades. It's just the, those two magnificent runs of theirs. I think the only thing that Gerda is short of is another win. And uh, Edward also, uh, yes, another win. And I'm going to sound like I'm, I'm lecturing here, but a truly great champion wins in both directions. Well, let's uh, go to 1975 as you raised it with Derek Price winning that race. Here's um, some footage of that event. Five Comrades was the 50th running of the race since its inception in 1921. Many innovations were introduced this year. For the first time, the event was open to runners of all race groups and to women competitors. Qualifying standards were set and the field was restricted to 1,500 runners, which did not meet with favourable comment. For the second time in its history, it was a successive uprun to mark the Golden Jubilee. The last back-to-back -back upruns were in 1940 and 1946, straddling the war years when no marathons were run. Alan Robb, who had won the Harley Ballington Trophy for the first novice home in 1974, led the 1,352 official starters until Harrison Flats, where 74 winner Derek Price effortlessly took over the lead. Rob slipped back to fifth place behind Gordon Shaw, Chris Sutherland and John McBrearty. Price won in a time of 5 hours and 53 minutes and in the year of the woman, Elizabeth Cavanna was the first woman to win a Comrades medal, even though an unofficial entrant, Letty Van Sale, was the first lady home. Vincent Roccabelle, who finished 20th, was the first black runner to win a silver medal. So that winning time uh, for, by Derek Price back in 1975, uh, replicated almost exactly by uh, the women, Gerda Stein winning the women's race last year. Now let's have a look back at the last decade of, or the past decade of women uh, champions. And Elena Nogalieva is the dominant name there, Bruce. Uh, yes, uh, what a fantastic champion. And, you know, people sometimes say to me, Bruce, no one will ever win nine like you did. But I said, well, Elena came very, very close. And if it hadn't been for her twin sister, Oliesa, she might have won more than me. And also, uh, she had a bunch of second and third places. So that is the standout champion, uh, women's champion of the Comrades Marathon. But what I've really, really enjoyed about the last six or seven years of the Comrades Marathon and without being, uh, without disparaging the male gender too much, the women's race at Comrades has just, it's just brightened up. It's been fantastic. Ever since Ellie Greenwood, I think 2014, Ellie Greenwood broke the Nogaliova twins uh, stranglehold on the race, Ellie from, uh, from Canada. And Thereafter, every single women's champion has been charming, beautiful, wonderful, eloquent, bright, a fabulous comrades winner. Uh, straight after Ellie uh, 
Uh, Caroline Warsman, what a fabulous winner. And I, I can say that she's a fellow bitsy like me, so well done. <laughs> Caroline Charnay, thoroughly deserved winner. Camille Heron, winning the up run, what, uh, 2015 or 2017? Uh, 2017. Uh, Camille, a California girl, um, just a wonderful, wonderful character. Uh, I always say she ran, she runs like a praying mantis, you know, she's got this <laughs> elongated running style, you can't, can't really work it out, but she's a fantastic winner. Um, and, and then Anne Ashworth winning also fantastic clinical, brilliant run. And then Gerda, what can you say about it? So it's, for me, the, 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 of the last few years, the really exciting thing has been the progress of, of the women's race and, and uh, how exciting it's become. And I absolutely love following the progress of those women. Kieran, talk to us about the, the Nugarleva twins. As Bruce mentioned, the dominance in that, in that period of the early, uh, around 2010, you worked at Mr. Price uh, with the athletes. What made them so, so good in South African conditions? And they were so loved here every time they came to Comrades. What, what was behind their dominance? Yeah, you know, the, the Nugarleva twins, um, I could actually say that, you know, they, they follow a similar pattern the same himself. Um, Alessia, the, the one sister, she has a 227 marathon, which is the same PB as um, Gerda's time. And then her sister Elena, um, the 229 marathon PB. So they were very dominant in the race. And I think that's, um, as Bruce would, would also say, the faster you are at uh, the marathon distance, just a few meters back, a wonderful feeling the women are starting to run much quicker marathons, like Anne Ashworth, the 235 marathon, a brilliant 16 uh, comrades finishing the club when she won the down run on a very long course. And then that is the faster the marathon women where the Gizzi is becoming four minutes to the dominance of the staff. The finishing straight, her time was just around about 6 hours 13, took her fifth victory and uh, her sister second. Uh, apologies about uh, Kuhn's uh, audio just breaking up slightly there, but I think we got a fair amount of information there from him about the Nagalievas and uh, their incredible performance. Let's have a look at the multiple winners in the women's race at the Comrades Marathon. And no surprise that we've got Elena Nagalieva there with her eight, Maureen Holland. And there's a name I think Kuhn, um, uh, Bruce, we don't hear much about, but uh, a woman who ran four, I think possibly because it was in the 60s and the 70s. And then when uh, we had the Comrades Marathon on television from what was it, 1982, 80, was it 83 the first time in uh, in its longevity, in, in its entirety that we got the people like Maria Backfrith, fun of over Helen Lucre, um, becoming dominant names. Letty van Sale being the first winner, uh, uh, but then disqualified. We've spoken about her, Geraldine Watson winning um, in the 30s as well, unofficially. But um, Maria Back, uh, Frith van Amover, let's go with Frith van Amover here, Bruce, because obviously there are that's your era mm. and we have spoken about her wonderful achievement. Uh, talk to us about Frith and what she was able to achieve. Well, I, I, I'm delighted to say I watched Frith transform, you know, a little bit like the caterpillar into the butterfly from being a really social runner at Wits University. I remember running cross country league races in, in April and May, and Frith used to come along and run the, the ladies' race for Wits University, and then she would join us afterwards when we went to the student pub for a few drinks. And she was really a social runner. And then somewhere along the line, like I suppose so many of us, she must have decided to see what happens if I train hard and I make a little bit of a commitment. And she really burst on the scene. Uh, and. Again, I think it. I think it's a. It's it's a crime that Frith only has three wins. She should have won many more, um, but for a variety of reasons she didn't. Uh, if you had to say to me, 
what is the greatest run what are some of the greatest runs you've ever seen and i see we're watching it i would say frith van der merwe's 1989 down run where she finished 15th overall has got to be one of the greatest ever comrades marathon runs i mean look at her she she looks fantastic she looks fresh strong full of running she's got a smile on her face and that was just completely superb five hours 54 as i said earlier when i started running if if you broke six hours you had a really good chance of saying i could have uh, as a male that you would win the race and here's a 554 from this impish pretty young girl from bits university running for benoni harriers then and I can say, if I, have I got a minute here just to tell a story, though? Because Thank my you. mate, Stuart Peacock, and my mate, Stuart Peacock, finished 13th that day. And he, it was his best run ever. He finished 13th. So it was a bittersweet uh, run for him because 13th is a magnificent position, but it's three positions away from getting a gold medal. So it was a bittersweet finish. But he said, as he finished at Kingsmead Cricket Stadium, he said the crowd erupted. It was just this roar all around him. And the noise was stupendous. And he said, this was incredible. So he started blowing kisses and air punching and waving at people and just celebrating his 13th position. And he said, as he ran the last lap, he thought, this is completely amazing. It's breathtaking. It's, it's goosebump material. What must it be like to win? I mean, I'm finishing 13th. And he said, he crossed the line. And he turned around to face the crowd after he crossed the line to give one last air punch, you know, to say, I've done it. And he said, as he did that, he saw Fritz van der Merwe coming around the corner and heading down the finish straight. So he <laughs> said, I defined the meaning of the word leopard crawl. He said, that's how I got out of there so that no one <laughs> focus on me anymore. Um, that's how fantastic her run was. And Fritz is, uh, yeah, one of the truly great legends of the Comrades Marathon. She is, she really is a legend, David. And because she was uh, from, from the Benoni kind of area, she'd often be around at races. I remember seeing her maybe three or four years ago, four or five years ago at the Alan Robb 32 kilometer out um, in Germiston and um, spoke to her a little bit about that. And of course, I asked her about that wonderful down run. And she said on the day, the night before, she just felt a wonderful sense of calm. And uh, she did something she usually never does. Mm -hmm. She had half a glass of wine before a race, but she was just feeling so good and she knew that she'd have a great run. And she says, just from start to finish, it was a magical day for her out on the road. And the time, as we heard, um, was, 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 was obvious that, that, that she would run that fabulous time. Uh, I, I love that story that she, she knew it the, the night before she was gonna have a great run. B Bruce said, do you, do you feel it in your bones the night before? Um, David, I would never be that arrogant as to say that you feel you're going to win. But I certainly started a couple of comrades marathons knowing that I would run five and a half hours. My training had told me that the way I felt, well, I get all the answers from certain key training sessions that I would do in the last couple of weeks before the race. So I knew that I would run five and a half hours. So there, therefore, I would say, okay, if somebody runs faster than that, when they then they will beat me but i certainly know tomorrow morning i'm not going to let myself down and it's a pity we don't have cheryl here uh to continue to talk to her because she shared with me the other day we did a i don't know what they call them nowadays a webinar a blog or something i'm, I'm far too old to know what's going on with these things uh technology but we she shared a moment where she said before 1982 she knew she was going to win the day before she knew she was going to win and I've certainly gone to the start line knowing, I can't say I'm going to win, but if you're going to beat me, you're going to have to lose an arm and a leg out here, mate, because I'm going to, I'm going to leave nothing out on the road. I'm going to run as hard as I can. So we certainly have that. And the converse is that, of that is that you know uh, sometimes when you're not going to win. Yeah, and the difference between the winner quite often is that they're pretty sure they are going to win. The contender is hoping to win. And... When I was beaten by my good mate, Nick Bester, we are great friends. I kind of knew that day, even though I lined up, I had a, a really haunting feeling that I'm not going to win this one. Uh, and I couldn't have handed on the baton to a, a, a better mate and a, a really great comrades runner than Nick Bester. Right. Uh, 
we're going to move on to uh, having a chat now. I'm, I'm going to hand the reins over to Mosabudi Whitehead as we bring in uh, Max Team Running Team Manager Martin and Gwenya joining our broadcast. Good afternoon, Martin, and uh, we've got Kieran Walker here, and I'm sure you will have a lot to say to him. I know how close the two of you are, uh, have been over the, the last decade or so. But, uh, I mean, just talk to us about Max Elite. When, when people in my generation, sort of their late 30s, maybe early 40s, mid 30s, uh, started watching Comrades, um, that Mr. Price was, was what we saw. Um, it was really at the forefront of the race towards the late 90s, and it's something that, um, as Max Elite, you must be quite uh, happy with, quite proud of the fact that um, this Comrades Marathon has become synonymous with Mr. Price and, and Max Elite. Good, good, good evening, everyone. Musi Bidi and David there in the studio and the viewers. And my, my fellow colleague, Q and Walker there and Bruce. And uh, let me take this opportunity and send my condolences first to the Clive, um, or the Clive uh, Crowley's family. And it was Clive, who was one of the oh. greatest comrades runner. And let me just send a uh, to, special to, to his wife, uh, Trish Crowley, who was also always there to assist the athlete. Yeah, talking about the next, uh, <laughs> next, next team. Um, so with the, as, you, as, you, as you remember, like you said, that in the 90s, he used to be the one of the best uh, team uh, to win all the, 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 the races and, and track, especially in track and field. We used to specialize that in the, in the track and field, like in the APSA series, yellow pages and all of that. Uh, but came 1995, where Sean Mikkel joined, win the first, first gold for the Mr. Price team. Uh, that's where we dominated from there. Since then, we have been dominating in the top 10, both in the ladies and the men's team, up until we changed the team to Maxed Elite. We are also dominating. So uh, I would say Comrade has been part of our family. Now, um, we've been, and even myself, I worked, I worked for Comrade for 12 years. So I've been part of this um, wonderful event for quite a while now. Um, and with uh, the help of Q and Walker also, uh, as you know, he's been called the encyclopedia because he knows everything. <laughs> I've, I've learned from him lots of things <laughs> from Q and um, we've been working together for more than a decade now. Uh, so yes, what I've saw, uh, uh, what I saw today, it was uh, a fantastic uh, thing to see South Africans supporting each other like it was a race, a, a, a comrade race itself. Because I was up and uh, I was uh, uh, wake up early in the morning today, around about three, to second one of my athletes um, to help them in on the road, to because some of the guys were doing 90, which is because Corner also did, did the 90 kilometers, and other guys they were doing 50, uh, 45 kilometers, and all the events like the 21k, some of them they did the 21k. So it was it was a, it was a great day for me today, and I also even us as a club we were very happy to be to be involved. With, um, with, with the Comrades Marathon uh, Association as uh, one of, of course, as now you know, that we are a technical sponsor for the Comrades Marathon also. So it is a, a great, uh, give us a, a great pleasure again to be part, to be part and parcel of uh, Comrades Marathon, uh, Comrades Marathon, yes. Martin, um, you mentioned Nkosi uh, Konam Shakwan as um, running, he was running the 90 kilometers of the virtual race today, race the Comrades Legends, and he posted his time. Uh, Kieran and I were just talking about it a little bit earlier, uh, that, uh, what's it, 5.55 clocking. Um, how, how do you look at the race? I mean, this year it must be bittersweet because you would have been hoping for another uh, gold medal on top of the podium, but um, how do you reflect on, on, on the virtual run, especially given the fact that uh, Mr. Price uh, is the technical sponsor in Max Delete? Uh, to honest, Mr. Vidi, as we reached the, the 60, K, 60 kilometer mark, and of course, I was starting to crumble and cramping and all of that, I was like, yo, can you imagine if it was a, a, an actual race now? <laughs> and this guy is doing this at the 60, at the 60 kilometers mark. Then we, uh, you know, 60 kilometers is still got a long way to go, and but it was keep on going, keep on going, and that uh, took me back to 2019 race where he was 
having the same problems, cramping and all of that, but he keep on going, keep on going up until he, he got the position 11. So uh, I think it, it, for him, it, it was a good thing and give us, uh, every now I'm still getting good bumps. Sorry, sorry about that. We got you back. Sorry guys, I'm sorry about that. It's even now, I'm, I'm still getting a good bumps, uh, good bumps for seeing, thinking about that, that what happens today, uh, seeing the guys like Paul Kumalo, helping him, pushing him, and the surprising thing that I saw on the route, at uh, the bottom, uh, uh, top of uh, Botas Hill, as we are coming down from the, um, what you call the school, uh, Kisney School, there were quite a few people that were waiting there, and as I was stopping the car to take up some supplements and everything, there were people that were asking me, is God going to leading? And I was like, he's leading. How come you say he's leading? There's, there isn't a, 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 an actual race. But it, it gave me a, 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 a hope that, and, and um, a happiness, actually, to see people that uh, they still want to watch combat, and they still told themselves that on this day, on the 14th, we'll be out there looking out for our heroes and um, to see them finishing the race or running the race. The, the race. But we were lucky again. And I'd like to thank also Comrade uh, Association, Comrade Marathon Association, to to stage this uh, Comrade Visual Race of the, uh, the Langes Race, which is uh, at least our South African or our fellow runners, at least they've got something to 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 do this year rather than to say, hey, the race was cancelled, was cancelled. But at least they done Comrade, and which is they are still the part of Comrade Marathon. Okay, Martin, thank you so much for talking to us. And uh, well done on seconding uh, Nkosi Kona there. Um, we remember that agonizing race last year when he uh, just uh, fell out of the positions, finishing in number 11 when he was on, uh, on course, I beg your pardon, to take the ninth position there. And um, this, hopefully next year, he can do well in the colors of Mr. Price. Thank you so much for talking to us and we look forward to the 2021 race. No, thank you so much, you guys. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Let's have a look uh, at the multiple men's winners of the Comrades Marathon. We looked a little earlier at the women's. And there you are, Bruce. Ninth place. Uh, uh, nine medals. First place, I should say. <laughs> it's, uh, it's certainly not ninth place. Top of that uh, list of multiple men's winners. Um, and way ahead of the others, four more than Jackie Meckler and a whole lot of people there. Um, you know, I suppose records are there to be broken. Um, well, let me ask Kewan this question. Do you think nine can be broken, Kewan, in the, in the modern era? Um, I'll, be, I'll be totally honest with you. In, in the men's race, uh, I don't see that happening. Um, to win nine consecutive comrades like Bruce did is, is just out of this world. Um, we, we nearly saw it happen uh, in the women's race with uh, Elena and Galieva. So perhaps um, if it could happen in, in the women's race, it, it could perhaps go to Gerda. Um, but I know she does also have other ambitions, uh, such as the Olympic marathon. But uh, yeah, I'm going to say on the men's side of the race, I, I don't see anyone uh, coming close to, to the feats that, that Bruce accomplished. It, it was just out of this world. And yeah, I, I don't see anyone winning uh, more than nine times. Is that a record of yours, Bruce, that you don't see getting broken anytime soon? You, you know, um, David, the great Wally Hayward, who's also on that list, as you saw, and I think he's the greatest comrades runner ever because he won five but was declared a professional and also gave up running the comrades for, for 20 years. I'm certain he, he would have won more. Um, and also his running the comrades in uh, 1988 at the age of you know, three weeks shy of his 80th birthday has to be the greatest single comrades performance of all time. Uh, he said to me, Bruce, I think it was a, a very wise words. He said, Bruce, we borrow records, but we keep titles. And a record, whether you break the record in the course, I mean, um, had a fantastic time last year. Some, someday another lady will come along and break that record. Uh, you borrow records, but you keep titles. No one will be e ever able to take from Gerda that she was the 2019 Women's Champion. And I thought that was quite a wise thing for what it say. So someday somebody will come along and win 10 comrades. And um, I'm just really delighted and proud to have written a, a chapter or so into the history of the comrades. And I still pinch myself every day 
that, and I'm sorry if I sound emotional, every day that I could have had the honor of winning, I think, one of the world's greatest races and the only ultra marathon that stands in the same pantheon of great marathons like the Boston Marathon, the London Marathon, the New York. I, Comrades is particularly unique in that it's the only ultra that stands in amongst those other races. Um, so, yeah, I've, I constantly remind myself that you borrow records, um, but you keep titles. So I will always be the 1990 winner of Comrades. Um, but somebody, well, all my records are gone. I mean, at one time I was the record holder for the up and the down, and those times have been shattered. I'm delighted to say my down run completely obliterated by David Kutebe. <laughs> David. What a fantastic <laughs> run. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, and at, at the time I was trying to figure out how someone could run faster because I remember going down the Berea thinking you can't turn your legs over any faster than this, so you're going to hold this record forever, mate. Well, I was proved myself wrong quite quickly. Um, but if I can just say on behalf of all the winners and that, that fantastic list there, um, we have all been privileged to carry the winner's baton more than once across the finish line. And it is one of the greatest honors ever. And I remember finishing, I think it was 88 comrades and Vreni Welsh, who's an absolutely wonderful lady who has done so much for running and uh, yeah. is part of uh, the Rand Athletic Club. As I came into the stadium, she said to me, Bruce, welcome home. Welcome home. And it just, uh, home is the finish line for all of us. And so for all Comrades runners, and so to lead the Comrades Marathon runners home as, as the first finisher is an honor. I have no idea how you can, how you, it's hard to describe it. Um, and in, the, in that 1988 race, uh, my seconds came to me right near the end. I had about two kilometers to run and they said, China, you know how we greet each other. My China, you've got, uh, you've got a 10 minute lead and no one's going to catch you. Enjoy it. And I froze that moment forever to keep for myself the honor of leading the comrades. I had two kilometers to go. My legs were very sore. I lost a couple of toenails, but I was running very fast. I knew I was strong. I can still taste the funny taste of the... <laughs> <laughs> the drinks we drink, the corn sugar drinks we drink, it was like making my mouth tacky and some sweat had come down and it was dripping into my eye and taking the sunscreen. But to lead the comrades is the proudest moment of your life. And I said, freeze this moment forever. Keep it in your memory forever. If ever I'm depressed, slightly disappointed with myself, lonely or sad, I can, I can literally thaw that moment out and take myself back there and say, you once led the comrades marathon. There's nothing more to say. It's just the greatest honor. And if I'm emotional, I sound it. I am because it is incredible. To be a multiple winner, Bruce, um, it doesn't mean that all the races were easy. And you certainly had some duels, as others on that list will have had. Talk to us about some of your rivalries with the likes of uh, Josia Chale, uh, Bob Delamotte, and uh, some of those who would be planning year after year to beat Bruce Fordyce in that era of dominance. Well, you know, I, as I have a great, a great bond with, with most of them. I mean, just you're an only great runner because they were great, because you can't run those times unless somebody forces you to run that time to win. So I, I'm surprised we haven't had m heard more of Alan Robb today. But my personal hero when I started was Alan Robb. I was a young Vitsi, and it was my job to invite him. As a, At that stage, he had won the Comrades once. I invited him to be the guest speaker at one of our pre-comrades functions. And I remember staring at him. I just stared and stared at him like he was a Martian. I was trying to work out what is so special about this guy that he's won it. What is special about Alan Robb? He is gentle, mild, modest. If you had to speak to Alan for a whole day and you didn't know it, you would never find out that he had won the comrades marathon. Speak to me for five minutes and I'll tell you. Um, so I'm just a complete contrast. And he was, he was one of my heroes. He was incredibly hard to beat. And of all my runs, the 1982 down run uh, against Ellen was the hardest race I've ever run. Uh, we, we broke away together going down both as hill. And notice how I say it's both as hill, not yes, Burtis yes, well Hill. <laughs> this is KZN. They have never heard of Burtis Hill. It is both as hill and it is Kloof. 
not yes. too often, it's KZ. So uh, we, we broke away together and a runner called Henry Niembi came with us who finished seventh that day. And I remember saying, I remember Henry saying, oh, yeah, this pace is too fast, so I'm gone. And for the next 20 Ks, the two of us went shoulder to shoulder and I eventually uh, pulled ahead of Alan, but it's what they call a Pyrrhic victory. I won, but the cost was so dreadful. I was so broken at the finish. I looked around twice going around the Spanish stadium to see if anyone was coming because I couldn't believe I could be leading the race running so slowly. So Alan was a fantastic uh, rival. Sorry, please tell me if I'm dominating the conversation too much. I'm, just I'm loving, the, loving uh, the story. You, you just opposition. keep going. Hosea, Hosea Charlie is, I think, one of the greatest ultramarathon South Africans ever produced who didn't win comrades. Um, he won everything else. He won the two oceans, the city to city in those days, the Peter Corky, the London to Brighton. He won everything. He just didn't win comrades. And if I could change the comrades marathon, there he is. Yeah, we can see him. Horse, horse as we affectionately know him, I would give horse one of my wins because he just thoroughly deserved to be a comrades champion. Bob Delamont, incredibly hard to beat going down. Uh, or somebody who believed he, was, he would win. Uh, not hoped he would win, believed he would win. And when he didn't win, he would just say, well, I'll do it next year. Uh, Mark Page, very good. And uh, in the early days, uh, Johnny Halberstadt. I think Johnny Halberstadt is, and Kewan might agree with me here, the greatest all-round distance runner we've ever had yeah. in this country. Yeah. His range of ability. So, so he had a sub four minute mile. I could never get anywhere near that. He won the NCA's triple title, uh, 10,000 meters college title in the States. He came third in the Boston Marathon. Any road race you name anywhere in South Africa, he won it usually twice. He just didn't win comrades. He, he came second twice. Um, and I'm going to leave somebody out and they're going to hate me forever and ever. Nick Bester, tough guy, but as I said, he was the one who finally broke my uh, streak. Sam Shabalala, a fantastic guy, guy to run. The, the people that I raced against, those men were legends. I mean, very, very difficult. You've got an idea when you run three and a half minutes a kilometer for 90 Ks to get away from them. It's, it's, in, it's tough. As you can see, I'm, I'm broken, hunched, and, and not quite the same as I used to be. For the, That was the cost. Uh, but it's an honor to have raced against those, those guys. I'd, I'd love looking at that footage uh, of, of the young Bruce Fordyce. Mm. Uh, it, it's lovely seeing that f footage again. And, and I suppose one of the things, Bruce, was that we had so little else to watch um, sports-wise that we became fixated on the Comrades Marathon. I know to some extent these days there's so much more variety, but I, I wonder if you weren't dominating in the golden era of, of Comrades Television. We'll talk to Jan Sneemann in a, in a short while. But you guys became celebrities, didn't you? We did, yeah. I mean, and by the way, you mentioned the gold and the locks. And gone. <laughs> but anyway, I've, I've managed to come to terms with that. Uh, I, I, I was gorgeous. And, um, <laughs> but yes, we did. We, we, because of sporting isolation, South Africa was almost forced to turn in on itself and watch. And if you talk to the cricketers, I remember talking to the very sadly Miss Clive Rice, who's a great mate of mine. He would say the, the, the Transvaal, as it was then, Western Province game at Newlands, was sold out. Sold out for a provincial yes. game. So we had very That's little. Right. And the same with the Curry Cup rugby, sold out. Um, you know, we had very little. So we turned in and we, we looked at what, what we did have. So maybe for comrades, that was a wonderful, wonderful uh, bonus. Uh, in that we, people fought, uh, watch comrades. And I, I, I still get stopped by people who say, you've got an idea how much I hate sport. But every single comrades day, we woke up at five o'clock in the morning, we made breakfast, and we watched that race all day long. And not just the winners. I mean, as we all know, the most dramatic moment of comrades is that final dreadful cutoff gun. And nowhere else in the rest of the world does that happen in any marathon. There is no cutoff. If you run New York, and I've run a few of those, it can be midnight. They better be there and take your, take your time and give you a medal. It's just, uh, it, it, but only in comrades do we have that brutal cutoff gun, uh, which just also is part of the, it's part of the whole, uh, the whole DNA of the comrades. The brutal cutoff gun is uh, massive. 
So yeah, I just sorry if I'm waxing lyrical, but I just love Comrade so much, and I, I love that event. And I think the sporting boycott at the time worked very well. Obviously now, wonderful people like Cheryl and the whole CMA have grown the race even more. Wonderful characters have come along to grow it even more. And it is just so rich with history, tradition, drama, passion, uh, that I don't know why anyone would not watch it. I, you know, just to me, comrades were watching that. The only thing I can equate it to is the this, uh, this same emotion is Cheslin Colby's try. Yes, <laughs> very good. A few yeah. months ago when he scored against England and he did that little punch, that was the same feeling I had as when I watched Comrades. Yeah, and, and a wonderful feeling that will be shared by all the other men on that list. Kuan, I want to pick your brain a little bit about uh, Bung Musam Tembu, whose name also appears on the list of multiple men's winners. Um, this week, um, I was in a press conference where we spoke to 2012 champion Ludwig Mamabolo. And he says, uh, although uh, Bung Musa didn't win last year, he still believes that Bung Musa is the man to beat uh, at the, at, in this current era of, of Conway's Marathon. And he says that he would like to come back and win the race again. And he, he says Bung Musa for him remains the man to beat. We saw last year how he was attacked by Mutibi and others going up in Chang'e and then all the way uh, to the finish. Can Bung Musa win again? And um, what makes him such a... Such a such a great comrades champion, both up and down. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, Musa can definitely win comrades again. Um, as you mentioned, he just lost out on that title last year to to Edward Mutibi. But uh, one thing I can also say about Bong Musa is, as Bruce will also know, um, you know the, the former likes of Dimitri Grishin, uh, Vladimir Kotov, uh, former multiple winners, who could only win it on the up run. Um, but could never ever do well when it came to the down. And Bong Musa was the same as that. Every year it went down, he was the man to beat. Uh, he won it a few times. But then every single year that the Comrades Marathon went uh, you know, towards Peter Marisburg on the up one, he would never finish in the top 10. So I even remember in 2017, um, you know, he was looking good going into the race. But because he had never done well in the up run, I, I had him down as like an outside favorite for, for a top 10. And then he went and won the race. So he cemented himself as both a, an, an up and down winner. And then, you know, just missed out on that victory last year. You know, he's a really humble guy. He trains really hard. Um, his coach down in, in Durban, uh, Kolani Mabida, you know, they've got a very, very good, strong team around them. And Bomusa focuses solely on the Comrades Marathon. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think that uh, Bomusa is, is definitely a force to be reckoned with. Um, he's made for ultra distance running. He's very. He's got a very strong build. Um, almost reminds me of of Nick Bester, that that Iron Man type uh, body type. And yeah, Bongusa definitely um, going into next year's race. I've, I've also put Edward there as a defending champ. But yeah, Bongusa definitely for for a good few years coming up will be the man to beat. Uh, wonderful scenes there. Um... I do want to go back to some of the other names that we saw on that list. And uh, Bruce, it was interesting that you were saying that Wally Hayward, you felt he was one of the great runners. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth pointing out that his first victory came in 1930 and his second win came in 1950. I know there was a war in between, but uh, between 1930 and 1940, he could have been winners there. It's, it's incredible that he's got that uh, time difference of 20 years. Let's have a look. We've got some footage of Wally Hayward winning in 1930. Hello, hello, hello. In 1930, and 55 oh, runners oh, yeah, started the up me. race. Amongst all the newcomers to the race okay. was the Johannesburg Wanderers runner Wally Hayward, wearing number okay. two. He was the current 10-mile track champion and at the age of 21 had surprised the pundits by entering for such a long distance. Hayward had reached Drummond in 3 hours 20 minutes but tired visibly towards the end. Despite cramps and walking up the hills, he reached the finish line just 37 seconds ahead of Phil Masterton Smith. Hayward was rewarded with a grandfather clock and this was the last year that sections of the road were still untarred. So that's something that I find absolutely amazing about those early runners 
They ran on untarred roads. Their Mosbudi and I were talking about this, the lousy shoes that they would have had, the bad advice on nutrition. They, to, to achieve the times they were doing, Kieran and Bruce, I, it's phenomenal what they were able to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I, I see why you say that uh, Wally Hayward is the great comrades runner, Bruce. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I think if you if you debated who, who the greatest runner is, it, it has to be Wally because because it is it, it, in his heyday he was he was never beaten. So he he only, if I can use that word, ran five, but he won all five. He was the first man to break six hours going down, and then he had that hiatus after his after those five runs. But as you say, between 1930 and 1950, he didn't run at all. And that was, he told me, because he hated the comrades' experience. His first comrades' run, he was leading by 20 minutes at Drummond at halfway. And he won, I think, by 20, 30 seconds from Phil Masters and Smith, um, who, by the way, had the second closest comrades' marathon of all time against Noel Bure. Uh, I think 1931, he won by two seconds. But so Wally didn't enjoy his first comrades' experience and, and went away from it and had a, a glittering career at other distances. Then when he came back, he won four more. Undoubtedly would have won more if he hadn't been uh, banned as a professional. And then came back and ran twice in 1988 and 1989, in just short of 80 and then just short of 81. And he beautifully proved there, I think, uh, the, the magnificent gift that Comrades is to everybody. You don't necessarily have to be number one to be a winner. Wally yeah. Haywood did not win the 1988 Comrades. I did. And I hope you can detect a certain <laughs> amount of bitterness in my, my voice because that old goat, and I'm saying with that with affection, stole all the media coverage, all the TV coverage, all the people wanting autographs, beautiful women draping themselves all over him. And, and Frith van der Merwe, who, who won that year, and I sat on our own having a quiet cup of tea while he, the, everybody frocked around him. And he proved that at the age of 80, you run the up comrades in nine hours, 45 minutes. That means he beat that dreadful cutoff gun by two and a quarter hours. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. I mean, at 80, you're supposed to be dead, not finishing the comrades marathon in, in, in that time. And he did. And he showed that you don't necessarily have to be number one to be a winner because on that day, Wally Hayward was the greatest winner of all of us. And so the, I think if you push me in a corner, the three greatest runs that I ever saw were um, Alan Robb's 1978 down run when he won by 20 minutes and broke five and a half hours for the first time. Frith van der Merwe, 1989, uh, 5.54. And Wally Hayward, age of 89.45. And now squeezed in amongst them, if you could have another color medal, I have to squeeze in Gerda um, Stein. But Wally's run was just completely phenomenal. There is no way I can answer that except to say that I have plans for the year 2035. <laughs> <laughs> before we I go to be Jan Snam, we before we go to Jan Snam, and Kieran, just to push you in a corner, uh, Bruce has raised the issue of the great r runs and the great runners, and and, and singling out Wally Hayward. Uh, can you be as conclusive as Bruce is about these issues, about who's the greatest runner? What are the greatest runs? Yeah, I think Bruce um, pretty much summed it up perfectly there. Um, I also agree that Wally Hayward, without a doubt, has to be the best of the best, you know, to, to win the race, come back 20 years later, win it again. And then, you know, at age 79 and, and 80, that, that sub 10-hour uh, comrades, it was phenomenal. Um, if I also had to, to put down memorable races, it would definitely be um, the, the list that Bruce just mentioned, Alan's uh, sub five hours, 30 minute run, uh, Fritz's uh, 5.54 down run, um, you know, Wally Hayward's finish, uh, I would throw in as well David Katebe, 5.18.19, really out of this world, like no one's ever come close. Um, and then, of course, Kader Stane's up run, that 5.58 on the up run, finishing 17th overall, um, phenomenal experiences. And then I'll add one more in, uh, 1997 Comrades Marathon, Percy Dunn uh, running a sub-six-hour Comrades uh, Marathon dressed as uh, the all-sorts uh, licorice man. So that was pretty uh, phenomenal there, there as well. 
don't forget that the, the virtual Comrades Marathon race is still on the go. You have until midnight tonight to uh, run your virtual race. And it's not a 90 kilometer or 89 that you need to run. You can run 5Ks as well. All the details have been up on the Comrades Marathon website. Uh, we've heard over 40,000 people have entered. It's, it really has been a bit of a game changer. It'll be so interesting to see how the Comrades Marathon Association approaches the 2021 version of the Comrades Marathon. Now, working on this particular broadcast, we have uh, some veterans uh, of the SABC in our producer, uh, director Scott Seward, Mike Demain, Richard Parker, who are all involved here. Um, they all worked on the Comrades Marathon back in the 80s uh, when it became quite a pioneering broadcast. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome one of the early commentators of the Comrades Marathon when he worked at the SABC. Um, if you're of my generation, you will well know Jan Sneeman, and he joins us now. Jan, my goodness, you have not changed. Do you not age, man? <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. It's really very nice to talk to you and join you. And when I got the call from uh, Scott Seward, I went on a, a hike on memory lane, going back to 1976, when television started in South Africa. And of course, one of the big events on our calendar every year since 1976 had been the Comrades Marathon. But the only thing that we could do at that stage, we didn't have everything going our way as far as equipment is concerned, etc., etc., and also experience. Uh, we had to take our film ca cameras down, down to Durban and do a highlights package of about 20 minutes on the day. And uh, that would have been edited and uh, uh, the committee would have been put uh, alongside it. And we had to wait another, let's say, fortnight after the uh, Congress Marathon before we could broadcast it. But everyone, of course, viewers would want to say that, why can't you broadcast it now? We, we didn't have the, the know-how, to be quite honest, to broadcast it. This went on from 1976 until uh, 1982. And I can't remember whether, whether it was the end of 1982 or the beginning of 1983, when uh, Robin Kempthorne, who was head of Outside Broadcasts, walked into my office one morning and posed me the question, and he asked me, would you say yes to a live broadcast 12 hours long of the Commerce Marathon next year? That is 1983. And I looked him in the eye, I said, why do you ask the question? He said, because I think we have reached the stage where we can do it. We have the equipment, we have got the uh, experience now, and we can do it. I said, but uh, what about my friend? I was the head of Afrikaans sport on TV, and uh, Trevor Quirk was the uh, head of sport on the English side, but he had already been to Trevor and said, dear friend, I can't imagine myself watching 15,000 pairs of tackies hit the tar for 12 <laughs> hours long. That will just not work out as far as television is concerned. I told Robin, I think I am with you and I'm going to leave you now and I'm going up to Peter De Bruyne, who was our deputy uh, general manager responsible for television. And uh, I asked him, would he allow us to do the Comrades Marathon in 1983 live from 5.30 in the morning, ending at 6 o'clock that evening. And he said, you go ahead and make a success of it. And that's how it started. And the first uh, producer who did it was Butch Smith, who had to get everything in order. It was like building a house and, you know, from the foundation up. The equipment we had in 1983, compared to the equipment that is available now, 
is like chalk and cheese because it was huge cameras. It was a sweat. It was a, something out of this world. We used uh, motorbikes on the on the on the on the on the road, helicopters up in the air, and uh, we. I'd say we did the best we could, but we got a lot of allocates, accolades from the from the viewers that we eventually did that. And the fact of the matter is that since then, 1983, the Promise Marathon had been on the air every single year with different uh, producers. But I think the the producer whom I would call the the father the old father of the Communist Marathon is Scott Seward, because the way that Scott Seward went about planning the entire broadcast from start to finish, every single moment was planned to a T. And uh, he won his accolades uh, during his uh, career with the SABC, but uh, he made it something really worthwhile. Well, I can tell you Scott Seward right now is playing this overlay or instructing, uh, the, making sure that this v footage of the 1983 Comrades Marathon is playing while we chat to you. So he's still very actively involved in TV broadcasts uh, about Comrades Marathon, Jan. Can you remember who all your commentators and co-commentators were? Because you really had to make it up as you went along on how to commentate for such a long period. I I remember that the at the start we had Ian Laxton, uh, and he, he was there for for many a year. I, I left the SABC in 1987, uh, and of course it's still going strong. Uh, we had uh, um, in the studio. I was in the studio at some time, uh, most of the times, and uh, Real Hauman, who is a journalist and a, a very very. Uh, guy who knows his sport, who knows long distances, marathons particularly. He was in the studio with me uh, on many occasions. And then Edwin van Arde was the commentator at the end. And of course, we had um, commentators during the course on the, on the, on the, uh, the route itself. Uh, the names I can't remember that, but they were there. Uh, we started very small, but you know, it, as as you go along, uh, it grows on you, and uh, the producers come up with marvelous ideas. And the thing is that where we started off, it was a bit, how shall I say, not really up to standard or up to scratch. But the way it's being done now, after so many years, uh, I can be very proud of what had been done and what what we have achieved. For our viewers, uh, and the, the fact of the matter is that when television came and we did the broadcast year after year, we also saw the growth in the participation of the Congress Marathon. And when we when we talk about uh, television licenses for for broadcast, the problems we had with rugby who wouldn't allow us. To, uh, to broadcast uh, rugby live. Those were the days, you know, when we started off, where we had other sports like athletics, like the Commerce Marathon, like tennis, who came to us and said, please come along, we can build the sport. And that is exactly what television did in many occasions uh, when we uh, did concentrate on those kind of sports. Look at golf, what happened to golf? Uh, don't tell me that because we do the uh, the golf tournaments in South Africa, uh, the patrons stay away. No, they don't. The more we do it, the more they come along. Well, we're just looking at footage now of Adrian Steed doing uh, some some uh, vox pops, as they're called, uh, on the route. So he was obviously involved as well. You may not have shared Trevor Quirk's um, pessimism about this working. Though, were you surprised, Jan, at how well received it was and how you'd actually pulled off a 12-hour or 11-and-a-half-hour broadcast? 
Well, the thing is, we were very, very proud of ourselves. You know, when, uh, as a matter of fact, right from the start, we were proud that we, that we even ventured to to do this. Uh, you know, things can go wrong and can go horribly wrong. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we tried our best, and uh, sometimes your best isn't good enough. Uh, but as the years rolled on, it became better and better and more professional. And the fact of the matter is that. Uh, we could bring the drama that you're seeing at the moment, we could bring that into the houses of our viewers. And uh, that's what makes the uh, Congress Marathon such a wonderful experience every year, because these things don't just happen. Uh, uh, now, it's, 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 you, don't have, you don't need a commentary to explain exactly what is happening there. Yeah, exactly. Colin Hoyerson crawling over the line. That was, I think, something I remember That's so it. well from 1983. Jan, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for your memories. Uh, really do appreciate it. And it's lovely seeing you look so well and healthy and your voice sounds just as I remember it. I believe you have just turned 81. I've turned 81, yep. But still going strong, still doing sport uh, on Radio Helderberg. Uh, but I'm on a sabbat sabbatical at the moment because there's no sport in the country. God, uh, I've got nothing to do. So I'm uh, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to just uh, give my views on the Commodore's Marathon and sport in general. It's lovely seeing you again. Thanks very much to Jan Sneemann. That was a, a name and a face from my youth. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, to bring back some memories for you watching a bit more footage of that particular race, Bruce. Uh, it did. Yes, it did. Um, two things. I just want to say thank you, Jan Sneeman, for everything you did for Comrades. Uh, amazing to see Jan. Uh, just uh, one of the great characters of the race. And you don't necessarily have to be somebody who ran to be one of the great characters of the race. And then, yeah... Uh, uh, my good mate Colin Hurson. I've forgotten how long he crawled. Wow, he crawled a long way. <laughs> but that's the that's the uh, the desperation of trying to win the last gold medal. Um, and Colin, yeah, crawled across the line to get uh, to get the last gold medal. And that was that was a, a really really well produced and well filmed and well covered uh, comrades marathon to all those people, Edward Fonarda, everybody who was involved at that time. Uh, uh, well done it was a brilliant comrades and it was particularly good for me because they wow well, they made me look good <laughs> so uh yeah special comrades marathon uh Kieran, you work on the on the broadcast it's a, a cast of thousands isn't it it's a a huge effort i i did two for the sabc um i couldn't believe how much went into it just give uh, our viewers now some perspective from 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 your side on that broadcast of the comrades marathon yeah, um, from, from my side, you know, I, I've got my, my green number, so to speak, in, in commentating. I've done over 10 uh, Comrades Marathon broadcasts for the SABC. Um, just uh, as I can say, an, an honor just to be part of the event um, and the history and, and, you know, of, of, of the race. But yeah, it's, it is a lot that goes into it um, from the production team to the cameramen, the riggers, everyone that puts everything up together. Um, in terms of, of what my day would look like in terms of a commentator, um, I would need to be at the, the finish venue where the, the broadcast and the, the studio is set up at 3.30 in the morning on race day. Sit in the, the very icy cold um, outside studio there with uh, Valen Kirtley and others. And then uh, once the race starts at half past five, um, we would cover the race the whole day. And yeah, by, by the end of the day, I don't really have a voice left after talking for, for over 12 hours. I'm sure people don't want to hear me speaking again for the rest of the year. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a long day. And, you know, having run the race myself as well, it's, it's quite a weird feeling being there. Coming <laughs> all you want to do is actually be on the road uh, running the race itself and, and feeling that pain. That's, that's the amazing um, hold that a, a race like the Comrades Marathon has over you. Kieran, what makes a good commentator, especially for such a long broadcast? I'm sure there must be times when uh, the race seems to meander, the, the, the gold medalists are all in, the silver medalists are all in, and we're kind of 
now waiting between um, Silva and Bill Rowan or, or later. So what makes a good uh, Comrades Marathon commentator and how do you prepare for race day? Um, for, for me, uh, I would say I'm a little bit lucky when it comes to the elite runners. Um, it, it didn't really work out for me in school, but when it comes to the Comrades Marathon and elite athletes themselves, I can remember what running <laughs> shoes even the, the athletes in the previous years. But, you know, um, as much as the race, it's, it's, it's really nice to watch the elite guys coming through and, you know, the heroes like um, the Hadders, the Ams, Edwards and Bormooses, the real race is about, you know, the other 25,000 odd athletes that are making that trip between Durban and Peter Marinsburg. Um, they are what makes up the Comrades Marathon. Without those athletes, there wouldn't be, um, you know, a, a huge race like the Comrades Marathon. And, you know, that's where a good commentator can just, you know, tell the story, what's happening in the race. Um, you know, a lot of um, family and loved ones are looking out for, for their, their family members, um, friends, work colleagues that are coming through at those times. So you just talk a bit about the race. Um, Having run it before also helps a lot because you, you can really relate to what the runners are going through and, you know, talk about the routes um, where runners are at certain points. And then also talk about the behind the scenes at Comrades. Like, um, not many people will know that there's over a ton of bananas that are used on, on race day. Um, quite random facts like that, but that, that just goes to make the history of Comrades uh, what it is today. I do want to talk Guys, about can I uh, just interrupt for can I interrupt for a um, second and just say I've commentated with Kewan. We've got Oh sorry Bruce, carry on. You carry on, Bruce. No, I just want to say he's the most knowledgeable, most incre he's a walking encyclopedia on running. And it's a privilege to uh, commentate alongside him because whenever you run dry, you just pass the ball to Kewan and he will <laughs> give you a list of, but not only that, he knows everything about every marathon runner in the world. We don't want to lose him because one of these days, Boston Marathon or New York is going to discover that New York, that, that Kewan knows everything and they're going to snap him up. So Kewan, it's always been wonderful to commentate alongside you because you're actually the, uh, you're the central pillar. You hold the whole thing together. Well, no, thank you, Bruce. I... And likewise on my side, just to be able to, to share the same seat with uh, a nine times winner like yourself and, you know, all the fellow commentators that have come and gone throughout the years, it's, it's just amazing uh, to be able to share that experience. So thank you very much. Well, one thing that I love about both of you is that your incredible depth of knowledge. And Bruce, I've had the occasion to interview you many times about the Comrades. And I've known that you do have uh, quite a knowledge of the history, but it's only today I realize just how deep it goes. You have dredged up names from the past uh, which I find absolutely fascinating. I love the history of the Comrades, and I love the fact that this we've got the Robert and Charlie Medal. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a, a man who, who ran in 1935. He didn't win the race. He, he, he was three hours after Bill Cochran, who won it in 1935. But what was special about Robert and Charlie was that it's the time in which he ran. He At a time where black runners had no recognition of any form, of any sort, and where laws were in place that ensured that he was excluded from so much of society, yet he ran the race. And I think it's wonderful that the Comrades Marathon Association recognizes people like Robert M. Charlie by having a medal named after him. So that's for people, if I got this right, who finished between nine and 10 hours. Can either of you tell me anything more about Robert M. Charlie? Uh, wow. I, I know he ran in the 1930s, is that correct? Uh, unofficially. Yeah. I believe, yeah, unofficially, yeah. Yeah, I believe that one of the runners who finished next to him gave him his medal. Uh, and he was cheered and, and celebrated all the way along the, the route, but he just wasn't official. Which tells you already how Comrades has been a, a kind of a litmus paper about where South Africa should be. It's always been telling us, come on, guys, if we can all run together, we can all run this race. Why can't we do this as a nation? Uh, and I, I think it's fabulous that there's a medal named after him. I think 10 hours is a great time, and it's inspired a whole lot of people. And I know uh, fellow comrades runners all around the world who, who desperately want the Robert Mishali medal, and they would have been running for it today. And in fact, as we look now, it would, have, it would all be over. But uh, there would have been a lot of happy people uh, 
having earned his medal. In fact, you, you write about the way Robert and Charlie was fated at the end because um, in John Cameron Dow's wonderful book, The Comrades Marathon, The Ultimate Race, he talks about um, a councillor, and presumably it could have been the mayor at the time, who gave him a special award. But it's wonderful that his name now is so synonymous with Comrades Marathon that there is a medal named after him. I think we're going to join, be joined now by the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal. We have got... Uh, uh, Sikle Zikalala joining us on our special program. Uh, Mr. Premier, thank you very much for your time. Good evening. Thanks a lot and thanks for having us on your program. Uh, we extend our best wishes to all athletes, the legends and those who are still running. Yep, they're still out there. We'd imagine it would be a very different day for you. Had there been no lockdown, you'd probably be at... Uh, the Moses Mabida Stadium welcoming the runners in. How is lockdown treating you as Premier? Well, of course, it is a, a challenging moment and uh, it's affecting both in terms of our social uh, orientation, but also in terms of economic uh, landscape. Uh, by now, we know that many people would have been in Deben and uh, Pitama respect. But nevertheless, we believe that the decisions by government to uh, impose or to uh, direct us to the lockdown is for the good cause. And we therefore believe that next year we will have a successful Comrades Marathon. Uh, Mr. Nishua, you are quite an active person uh, if your social media has anything to go by you uh, often post videos of exercising i mean uh, as as a public figure when you're a premier also a public figure is it important for you to to exercise and and stay fit and healthy and will you ever be on the road between durban and peter maritzburg running uh, 89 or 91 or whatever it is kilometers well, though I haven't run the marathon per se, but I'm hopeful that soon I will do uh, uh, the full uh, Comrades Marathon. We will want to continue encouraging the people to stay fit. And that's why today I dedicated some time to run. And I did uh, something like 14.5 kilometers uh, running. And I would want to encourage all people to stay fit. Physical exercise is important because it also shapes your mind and your thinking. Mr. Premier, well, it's been uh, wonderful hearing from you. And I, I'm encouraged to hear that you have a Comrades Marathon on your horizon. Did I understand that right? You, you say you are one day going to run the Comrades Marathon. One day I will definitely participate and uh, I want to encourage all athletes not to lose hope. It was just for this year because of the pandemic, but we want to all stay on course and be ready for next year. Let us uh, train, let us ensure that we prepare ourselves once the lockdown is over. We will again enjoy ourselves and the marathon. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Premier. That is the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal, Sikle Zikalala. And I believe we have uh, been, we're being joined now by another big name from uh, the Comrades Marathon, not only as a, a former winner, is one of the, uh, the great warriors. Uh, Bruce Ford, I spoke about the great rivalry that he had with Nick Bester. Uh, but also Nick Bester is one of these men who has trained uh, and brought some of the great Comrades Marathon winners to the fore. So we will uh, we'll have a chat to him in a few minutes time as soon as we can get him up. Just to remind you of uh, what's happening today, it's this the virtual race. And we have been so encouraged by the number of people who've been taking part in the virtual race. What is the number we had, Mosabudi? Something like 43,000 people. Yeah, 43,000. Yeah. Taken part in the, in the virtual race. And you do have until midnight to complete it. In fact, if, uh, as uh, we heard from um, Colin uh, Hechter uh, from uh, Championship, you've got anywhere in your time zone up until midnight. So there'll be people in, uh, in Hawaii who might be um, 
uh, still running the race. Let's have a look at Savages Club. They've been sending through some photographs as well. So these are the people from Savages. Uh, a lot of people running with the number one in uh, in memory of. Uh, of okay, there we got some of the um, the uh, the people. Um, yes. Lovely photos there, and uh, that's uh, they're all running in honor of uh, Blanche of the late Craft Crawley. Yes, and she also ran for Savages when she was still a cross country runner, and she has remained with the club ever since. Of course, uh, this is one of the iconic Comrades Marathon clubs, having given us uh, the Comrades Marathon, and there they are celebrating the legend's life yeah. as they run the virtual race. And I love the fact that they're paying tribute to the man who passed away in more than number one, Clive Crawley. Is that number one for Clive Crawley or? Uh, yeah. That's one done. Yeah. It's all it's all number one for Clive Crawley. That as it turns out. So well done to Savages for the way in which they've done. Uh, they've embraced the, this particular um, virtual uh, marathon. Um, and I loved seeing this morning the number of people who are out running and had their uh, their comrades uh, uh, numbers on. And their well, club colours as well. They all went out in their club colours. He didn't just put on his old t-shirt and shorts. He wore his full club kit and everyone was out there wearing their club colors as though they would were running the comrades marathon in official race colors so. well let's find out if nick bester was wearing a, his green uh, vest this morning who joins us now hey nick good to see you good evening now for some reason we are we going to get some Sorry, Nick, we don't seem to have the audio from you. We're going to try it again, find out why we don't have any audio. I'm going to bring Kewen in. Uh, let's just talk about Nick Bester, Kewen, as uh, one of the great comrades uh, competitors, but also as one of the great comrades coaches. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, Nick winning the, the race uh, back in 1990, where he dethroned Bruce and, uh, you know, it's taking, taking the victory there. Sorry, 1991. And now, um, you know, national team manager of the very dominant NetBank Running Club, and now coach extraordinaire. Um, you know, the things that he's done with Gerda Stein, where in 2017 finishing fourth in Comrades 6:45, now breaking six hours as as we've mentioned a few times last year, and a 2:27 marathon at, at the New York Marathon, which is not um, a really fast course. It's me. Fast. It's okay. We haven't seen uh, the full potential of Gerda. And yeah, Nick Bester, you know, motivating thousands of athletes uh, across the country, around the world as well, and a uh, great gentleman of the sport. Let's see if we can get Nick back. Uh, don't know if we, you can hear us all right, can you, Nick? Yes, I can hear you. I'm, ah. I'm on, on, on. And we can hear you as well. Did you go running today, Nick? Yes, I did run because we've got a personal challenge because between all comrades previous winners you have to beat your age on a 10 kilometer and women have to beat their age 10 kilometer time plus their age and we run a race against all of the legions you know myself Bruce Fordyce even the comrades marathon association chairperson Cheryl winners competing uh, pushing a husband, Cheryl Wynn in a wheelchair. We've got Leonard Svetsov, uh, Oleg Karitanov, Gerda Stein, Edward Motivi, all the likes of that. It is a great race. This is the ultra marathon race in the world. And you, you know, on the, on the road when I was running, there were so many people who stopped me when taking pictures and talking about the comrades and, and, and. And it's just emotional to see how much this race is meaning to thousands and millions of runners in, in the world. What gives you greater pleasure, Nick, your own victory or when you see the people you have coached coming in and winning? Not my own victory. I'll be, be really honest with you. When I won the commerce in 1991, it was as is it as is going to be a formality. So that is not so major on my radar. On my radar is this race. I see this emblem of the race, the Commerce Marathon. I'm getting goosebumps. When I'm hearing the chalice of fire, I'm getting goosebumps. 
we're seeing people gunning for the last people to be home at the Comrades Finish, wherever it is, in Durban or in Marisburg, giving me goosebumps. Goose, goosebumps. It is not about me. It's about the race. This is the race. This is the race. Everybody is talking the whole week about this race, the Comrades Marathon. It's amazing. It's emotional. And it's an emotional part that pushed me to victory. I was not a great athlete. I was, I was, I was, a, I was, I was a, oh, a dry athlete. And when I decided to run the Comrades, I just get my emotional side behind the Comrades and I won the Comrades. And that is amazing for me. When I, when I went into Comrades, normally I sent my family to, to Durban to fly two to three days before I depart. And then I motivate myself. I listen to Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, all those artists, and I motivate myself. And that is the race. It is emotional race. Nick, you mentioned that you were a triathlete. Uh, and I think you were, you were a pioneer in that time because you were, you were doing triathletes. I think you were also canoeing. You were doing a lot of cycling. So you did a lot of cross-training. Uh, do you encourage athletes nowadays to do uh, a lot of cross-training when they are training for comrades, be it cycling, canoeing, swimming? I can tell you that running is the most demanding race in the world. You put your on your feet on the ground, you're distracting your body. Every step you do, you are breaking down. So what I discovered is that cross training is the best way to prepare for comments. You run the, the, the limited amount of mileage. You substitute the rest of the junk mileage that you have to go and do and jog your job by cycling, canoeing, cross training, walking, ETTC. To enhance your body, you do the same kind of training. You actually save your body with the amount of jarring on your body. When I was doing my 10K this morning, I was going quite well. I started over 425K per, per, per kilometer, then 430, then 435, then 440. And then the last three, four kilometers, I was suffering because I, 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 I could feel my calf muscle was going to pull because that is running, is jarring jarring on a body. Running is the most jarring and I would say tough sport on the body. Sacrifice and supplement it with cross training and then that's my, that's my kind of philosophy and that's how I train my athletes for comrades and my athletes competing in the world stage for the 50 kilometer and 100 kilometer championships. Well, Nick, it's always a pleasure chatting to you and I I know it's a, a bit of a frustrating time for you, but uh, I do appreciate you joining us on our special Comrades Marathon, virtual Comrades Marathon broadcast. All the best, and we'll chat in 2021. Yes, thank you. Looking forward to 2021. We uh, all hope that everything will be fine and COVID-19 won't be COVID-21. And yeah, <laughs> let's have a great Comrades coming. <laughs> Coming, coming to us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much to the, the fabulous Dick Bester. And now let's go to the head of marketing for Mr. Price Sport. We're joined by Dylan Cherry. Dylan, thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Uh, we are very good and you are appropriately branded as well. Um, we've got you on there. All sorts of things we could be chatting about uh, with Mr. Price Sport. We we're talking about the brand earlier, how synonymous you've become with the Comrades Marathon. Can you take us back and tell us about that association, how it came about? Yeah, so um, the Comrades uh, Marathon actually has had a quite a long partnership with um, Mr. Price and um, started in the early 2000s where we, we used to actually provide the entries. Uh, you could enter at a Mr. Price store around the country. And um, so we were kind of like the RT partner before the likes of Championship came along. And, um, and yeah, it was always uh, 
an amazing thing. I wasn't with the group back then, but it was an amazing thing to see the uh, the comrades and the Mr. Price partnership and um, how they work together. Um, and uh, I think this this kind of virtual event has really shifted things. Um, but uh, it's amazing to see how the the comrades has kind of moved at the times and got on board with this virtual race. Um, and it's quite exciting to see the the types of people that have that have got involved and um, become part of the race. But um, to your uh, question, I mean, Mr. Price Sport, uh, the division that I work for, is actually only uh, started in 2006. And um, so we're, we're quite new on the scene in terms of our age, but, um, but yeah, enjoying this, this new partnership with the comrades and um, really an opportunity for us to, to showcase some of our technical product and um, you know, give people the, the opportunity to uh, get an affordable product that does the job of being active. On that point um, about uh, the technical um, uh, products that you offer, I mean, uh, for, for the longest time, the South African runner has believed that the more expensive the running shoe, if I'm going to spend 12 hours in it, the better. And so when Mr. Price Sport came out with, um, with the Comrades shoe, the Max Elite shoe that uh, David Khatebe won in, people were like, no, that shoe's different. The one they made for him is not the one you'll buy at a Mr. Price store. And I remember a furious debate on Facebook uh, where q was asking people and telling them that it's actually a pretty good shoe and he tried it out himself. But have you seen um, greater interest in your running shoes because of the association with um, Comrades? Yes, I think um, it was it was kind of like the best kept secret, if you want to call it. Uh, I remember when I when I joined Mr. Price Sport, Kieran was still there actually, and um, we uh, we uh, we I think we just won another five gold medals or so, and um, so it was the first thing I looked at and said, we have to let people know about this. Uh, you know that we've actually got you know so many runners uh, actually coming in the top ten. And um, winning uh, in our shoe, and um, you know, it's the same shoe you can buy in the store for 459 rand. How has uh, lockdown affected your marketing strategy now, not only for for comrades but going forward, Dylan? So, yeah, we've been obviously uh, taking quite a bit of a focus on the the online and uh, social media channels. And this uh, this virtual race has really been something that's that's blown that wide open for us to you know kind of see the participation and the the people who are involved um, in online and, and like we're doing now with this virtual race we uh, we can obviously see that it's it's kind of like the new normal if you want to call it. Now I believe you've got some uh, something to show us, Dylan. Ah oh, yes, so. I was going to share with you guys some of the the team that have been um, running with us this morning, and um, so we had some of our team from our office uh, who were participating in some of the uh, shorter distances, and I'll just share that with you quickly. So this was our HR people and um, our uh, man Thomas Thornhill from our resourcing department enjoying a, a coke he ran the 21k this morning and um our lady from hr there joanna bond uh, she ran a 5k and her husband a, a 10k so yeah it was it was great to see some of the team out there and um taking part in the in the race uh, or in the, in the virtual run i should i should say the challenge and um and then also these are just some images from from our, uh, um, let me just get it up there for you guys. I can see that you've been doing a lot of this during lockdown, meetings where you screen sh <laughs> sharing, haven't you, Dylan? <laughs> yeah. So, so here is uh, in Kosi Corner, who ran 90 Ks. And um, yeah, he was, he was cramping, as Martin was telling us earlier during the run, but uh, but I just thought what an amazing effort to, to run 90Ks 
I mean, he had the support of Prodigal and, and some of the guys there, but um, I just thought, you know, without the half of the race going around you, he, uh, he really um, put in a great effort today and, and ran the full, full 90. Uh, Prodigal ran the 21. And um, yeah, we, I think we had someone, a team member running in each, each distance, but I, I just uh, wanted to share that with you guys. I'm glad and you did. And here is uh, product. Sorry. No, I'm just saying I'm glad you shared. Have you got something more? Okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So, Prodigal ran the the 21 in a time of one hour and, and 11 minutes and 19 seconds, and then uh, that was uh, Charles Tajani. I think he wanted to try and give the full distance a go, but uh, came up with uh, 47 kilometers, which is is nothing nothing to uh, to sneeze at. But, um, but yeah, those were just some of the images from the day and um, obviously all shared via social media and, um, and yeah, en enjoyed seeing all the activity and the, the guys getting out there and, and, and enjoying themselves. Oh, very nice. A final question for you, Dylan. Are you amazed, impressed at the way this virtual race has taken off with 43,000 people, not only here in South Africa, but around the world getting involved? That might unlock a few more marketing strategies for Mr. Price Sport? Yeah, so I was looking at that actually, and I saw that I think it's, we had just over 70 odd percent to a local entrance. And um, I was chatting with Colin and he mentioned that uh, over a thousand people from Brazil. I mean, it's, I thought it's, it's really is incredible. It does open us up even I think for comrades itself to the rest of the world as a, as an event. I mean, not that it's, it isn't popular or well known worldwide, but uh, I think it's an amazing thing to to see the pos uh, participation across the the rest of the world. Dylan, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for your time, and let's hope uh, we see Mr. Price Sport back on the road sooner rather than later. Thanks for joining us this evening. Yes, thanks, guys. Cheers. That, that is Dylan Cherry, who's the head of marketing at Mr. Price Sport. Um, they've obviously been a a huge influence in the in the comrades marathon mosbury yeah yeah certainly and um when whenever i go down to run the race you'd always get the the, the booklet um in the last what 10 20 years and uh read about mr price durban based company wander into the store which you shouldn't be doing the day before the race but there i was uh <laughs> looking for a pair of socks which is not the right thing to do but yeah um and um i actually bought a pair of the shoes they were talking about after that conversation that we had with with Kuan on on Facebook about the quality of the shoes and I was running in them earlier on this year and they're actually a pretty good pair of, of shoes cool. but yeah especially if you if you're light on your feet great pair of shoes no I'm, a, I'm something on my feet and uh, now we got a, <laughs> a, a we got a photograph of some of the kit they had in 1921 let's have a look at that can you imagine running like this uh, Bruce Fordyce this guy was running in uh, his boots, but I do recall there is also a story in John Cameron Dow's book about somebody who ran, he was a Springbok rugby player, and he ran in his rugby boots. Uh, I don't know if you, either of you can remember who that was. I think it's in the 1920s. Yes, Bill Payne. Bill Payne. Exactly. Yes, David, Bill Payne. He ran, I think, the second comrades maybe whatever and he ran in he is legendary comrades running he ran in rugby boots the whole way he stopped at drummond for a chicken curry <laughs> uh and en route uh swallowed a couple of peach brandies and some schnapps uh, and then finished within the cutoff time the following day he had to play a rugby match he played in what they would call in those days plimsolls um, because his feet were sore from the rugby boots. He never ran commas again. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing achievement that he actually did it. We're going to speak to Dr. Jeremy Bolter in a couple of seconds, but can we just talk about the nutrition, how things have changed. When you consider the starting uh, in comrades in the late 1970s, what were the the things medically you had to do, dietary-wise, um, the amount of fluids you had to take in. What was the medical advice that you used to adhere to then that are complete no-nos today? 
Okay, well, I have to go back, Dave, I hope I've got a bit of time here. I have to go back to the 1974 British Lions. Yeah. Who, as you will recall, Willie John McBride's Lions gave the Springboks a 4 0 club. It was actually 3 0, but had there been a TMO in yeah. those days, it would have been 4 0. Yeah. And they uh, Ian McLaughlin's try would have been allowed. Ever. They, were, they were gods on the rugby field. JPR Williams, Willie John McBride, Phil Bennett. I can name every single one of them. And by the way, I'm a passionate Springbok supporter. So they gave us a thorough hiding. But one of the things they did was they were so frightened of the African sun being Europeans coming out from, from Europe that they took salt tablets to stave off cramps. And so this, this uh, nutritional advice s swept its way into running. And so when I ran my first comrades in 1977, we swallowed salt tablets the whole way through the race so that we wouldn't cramp. We were completely astonished why we cramped horribly the whole way through the race because <laughs> we were dehydrated. Then, then a couple of years later, and, and he's one of the great, uh, one of the great uh, scientific uh, sporting doctors, Dr. Ivan Cohen, decided that the solution would be, uh, the danger was dehydration. And Ivan, and he's an old friend, I haven't seen him for years, but Ivan, if you're listening, I'm saying this with, with all affection and, and for everything you've done, the contributions running, was that you had to fight off dehydration. So he worked out the exact solution that you had to drink that would, would drain the fastest from your stomach when you swallowed it. And so I was one of the guinea pigs who volunteered. We had tubes down our noses and you had to swallow this tube down into your stomach without vomiting and then, and then run flat out for a couple of hours on a treadmill. I don't know. I wasn't even paid. I don't know why I did it. But anyway, <laughs> and, and then they drained, they drained the remains out of your stomach after you had run yourself to exhaustion to see which, which had the most amount of fluid and which one had drained the most. So that was a liter of water with some, some uh, glucose or sugar added and a pinch of salt. And then came the, my era, the era of carbohydrate loading. And that was because a fantastic marathon runner called Dr. Ron Hill, uh, with a PhD in chemistry, uh, who also happened to be a fabulous runner. He won uh, the first Englishman to win Boston, he won the European Championships, he won the Commonwealth Games, and he was just impossible to beat for about five or six years. And he found a diet that Swedish long distance cyclists had been using called the Sultan diet. That is not salt, that's, uh, I'm not, talking about the 1974 Lions anymore. It was called named, and it was, what you had to do was you had to, with a week to go, go for a long run, deplete your body of all the glycogen you had in your muscles and in the liver, and then for three more days, continue to run, uh, eating only meat and, and fat and, and salad and lettuce. So basically, Tim Noakes' banting diet. And then at the end of that, you had to then switch and not train anymore for the last three days before the race and carbo load. That, that meant bury your face in donuts, chocolate, alcohol, sugar, and as much as you could until you were completely full. <laughs> and then the idea was you would go into the race with an overloaded fuel tank. You would go into the race with an overloaded fuel tank. And by the way, it worked. It worked yep. fantastically. For me, it worked fantastically. Uh, and so that's what I did. I did the Sultan diet every single year and it never went wrong. Now, I mean, obviously things have become more complex and there are all sorts of different ideas, but there are not a lot of people who are running under five and a half hours still. I mean, if you look at Edward and, and Bong Musa uh, last year, they didn't break five and a half hours. And I'm not sure if they're doing the Sultan diet. So maybe they need to get hold of Ron Hill's book. Um, and have a look, but I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't try that diet now for all the tea in China, but it worked at the time. And then you had uh, Wally Hayward who'd eat a steak before he went running. In fact, let's get um, a medical man. Well, on no, Wally Hayward that. would wake up at three in the morning and grill his own steak and chips with, um, with, at three in the morning and then run. But then remember, the Wally was so gifted. Wally was so gifted that he could make horrendous mistakes and still win. I've I've had the steak and chips at the end of the evening at three o'clock in the morning. We've got <laughs> yeah, Dr. Yeah, Jeremy yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Jeremy Bolter joining us now. Good evening, Jeremy. Thanks for your time. Good evening. 
I don't know if you've been hearing Bruce Fordyce running through the various fads and diets and nutritional advice that he was getting. I've just heard the last uh, couple of minutes of it. Um, well, it, it went from I, salt I tablets the to carbo when, loading. Uh, yeah, on, I Jerry. remember the days when uh, carbo loading was, was the, the fashion. Um, there were carbo loading parties uh, three days before comrades all over the country. And um, as Bruce said, it, it worked in those days. Things have, science has evolved and changed things, but um, probably the basic principles apply that you, you still, you need the, the, the muscle build up beforehand and you need the energy whilst you're running. And uh, how you get that energy is dependent on the individual very much. I love the fact that the science keeps evolving, but uh, we, we certainly don't have the, the science as it existed when Arthur Newton was winning, where it was the drinking anything was um, frowned upon. Uh, how advanced are we now in understanding the physiology of the, of the runner? Oh, we're, we're hugely advanced. Um, as you say, back in Arthur's uh, time, uh, it was frowned upon to to drink fluid. And when I first became involved with Comrades 42 years ago, the idea was that uh, you should drink somewhere around a litre per hour that you're on the road. Um, that went out of the window when we discovered that runners were becoming hyponatremic or overhydrated as it's called. And it's now changed to uh, drink enough, but drink when you need to. And it's, a, it's an individual thing. Uh, every runner is different. It depends on their, their size, their training, their speed, and the weather conditions that apply as well. So uh, one, one size certainly doesn't fit all. We apologize for that uh, break in transmission. It's, uh, we're just about to wrap up our broadcast. Uh, Jeremy, are you able to hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, the question I was asking before we had the break in transmission is whether uh, carbo loading now is a, th a thing of the past. Bruce was saying that when he was doing it, it had worked for him. Uh, have we moved on from, from the notion of carbo loading? Yes, yes and no, I think. Um, look, I, I'm no expert on, on the, the nutrition of uh, running. Um, my field is more the, the treatment of the collapsed runner. But, you know, you need the carbohydrate as a fuel. And the method of getting it and how much you, you take 
just before and on the day varies, I think, depending on the latest uh, scientific decisions or, or discoveries, as you, uh, as you might put it. Um, the, the, the essential still is that you need the, the uh, protein to build up your muscles and replace those that are damaged whilst you're training, and you need fuel during the race or, or the run. And how you ensure that you get enough also varies tremendously from one individual to the next. Okay. And again, from the, the, the top class, the, the front runners, to the the 12 hour runner, runner and the comrades. It's a completely different approach that is, that is needed. And it's very much an individual approach, but that person has to decide through their training and essentially to, through trial and error, what they need, how much they need and when they need it. Um, not to take too much of one thing and, and another. And a final question about the advances to the the emergency medical tent at the Comrades. Just to give us a, a sense of what it's like there and the kind of preparation that you put into a Comrades Marathon medical uh, experience. Well, the, the, the change from my first time in 1979 from a, a three by three army mess tent to a, a two and a half thousand square meter tent now uh, is indicative of how one of the changes has been in the size of it and the staffing. Way back, we the idea, it started because it was found that runners were ending up in hospital in acute renal failure because they'd become dehydrated. And my predecessor, the late Dr. John Godlinton, who started the medical facility um, said quite simply if they had been rehydrated after the race they wouldn't have ended up in hospital and that's how the tent came about initially we put a drip up on every patient that came in um, over the years we've advanced as it were we have a little mini laboratory in the tent so we can get essential blood tests done within a matter of 10 or 15 minutes to assess the patient's sodium levels, which is a direct indication of their level of hy hydration. And so we know who we need to uh, give intravenous fluids to and who we don't. We also have an ICU section now. It's a, it's a fully equipped ICU, just as you would get in a, a normal, well-equipped hospital setting for the really bad cases that we get. Um, but we still are, what I like to say, essentially a very high class and very well equipped first aid medical station. And our uh, aim is to rehydrate the runners that need rehydration, rehydrating, uh, treat runners effectively so they can leave us and go home with, and not run into trouble later. But those who are in serious trouble, stabilize them and then get them off to hospital where they can be uh, properly treated and be discharged when they're fully recovered. Well, an important role we that you play. Jeremy, well, thank you very much uh, as we are wrapping up our broadcast. I do appreciate your time and that uh, look at the important work that you're doing and uh, we hope that you'll be putting up that huge tent this time next year for Comrades Marathon 2021. Thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. We'll be there next year. Thank you very much to Dr. Jeremy Bolter and also thanks to Bruce Fordyce. Bruce, you have kept us wonderfully entertained and I know it does sound like there are a couple of uh, hooligans in the background there that you might want to go and join. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm socially distanced. I'm all that. It's the next door neighbors. It's okay. the next door neighbors. But just one point everybody said, by the way, um, to all the comrades runners, fantastic, well done, brilliant today. The gifted ones like myself and Nick Bester are gifted because we did one wise thing in our lives. We chose our parents with great care. <laughs>
That's a lovely way to end. Bruce, thank you very much to you. It's genetic. Uh, well, thank I you, guys. It's been fun. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you so much. To Kieran uh, Walker as well, thank you so much for joining us, Kieran, and sharing your uh, incredible knowledge. It has been great fun. Well, thank you, um, David and Mosibodi, for having me. And it's been uh, another honor again uh, sharing the, the stage, so to speak, with uh, Bruce. And if I have any parting words, uh, just going back to the diet talk that everyone was talking about, I think everything works differently for different people until you find the, the, the right recipe. But uh, in my closing words, I'll just uh, leave a very famous uh, Nick Bester quote where a lion doesn't eat spaghetti. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a, a lovely parting shot. Thank you so much to, to Kieran. And Mr. Buddy Whitehead, uh, are you going to be running next year? Well, hopefully. Hopefully, David. Looking forward to next year's race. Training starts tomorrow. And well, yourself? No, I you thank goodness I broke my ankle a couple of years ago <laughs> and the surgeon said, you're never allowed to run again. I'm happy doing this job instead. Well, Woody, it's been great fun broadcasting with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, David. And my thanks to the team behind the scenes on this. It was wonderful working with a team of people who were instrumental in bringing the Comrades Marathon to our screens back in the 1980s. From me, David O'Sullivan, thanks for watching and bye-bye.